This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is Friday, a fantastic Friday edition. It's it's uh, May fifteenth, twenty fifteen. Coming to you live from the studios, the new studios of the Hagman and Hagman Report, based in northwestern Pennsylvania. I'm Doug Hagman at the helm with fellow investigator, researcher, and most importantly, my son Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report, what we like to call America's premier father-son investigative team, investigative reporting team. And our job is to bring you the news that propels the headlines, the stuff that really is behind the smoke and mirrors of the corporate media, the news that is convoluted, that's Twisted and hidden amid a funhouse of of the smoke and mirrors and the carnival. When we're allowed so, to read it. When we're when we're allowed to read it, indeed. We do the headline and news triage, so you don't have to. And we'd like to thank each and every one of you, all new listeners, for checking in from all over the world. You know, this weekend I'm going to be sending out uh, some emails to to people. I, I've I've been so remiss. Um, uh, having moved, uh, you know, the the studio and trying to get settled, and but but we really want to thank each and every one of you for all you've done and all you do, your prayers, your your communications, your the information that you sent. You know, it, it's amazing the information um, that we get. It's um, well, we're going to be getting into that here in a little bit, but I do I do want to just say that uh, uh, for new listeners, we broadcast each and every weeknight from. Uh, Monday, well, Monday through Friday, 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Our home base on the Internet is Hagman and Hagman.com, and we're simulcast by the Christians United Broadcasting Network. Our home base, again, Hagman and Hagman.com. From there, you can a- access us live, as well as all of our past shows, our social networking sites, and most importantly, our original investigative reports. And once more, you know, this weekend we're going we're gonna to really um, use the time this weekend away from the shows to uh, uh, to relax. really advance that. <laughs> yeah, relax, <laughs> right? Um, no, I got plenty. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 you don't. No, you don't. You I didn't check. You I didn't did, check your schedule, yeah. right? All right. Uh, t- tonight, this being Friday, we're gonna. This is a kind of a follow-up Friday. Um, we're gonna hit a number of topics this evening that that we really need to get into. Uh, we we've had um, this past week it was a good week. We, yesterday, of course, going backwards, we had uh, Coach Dave Dobmeyer and uh, uh, Greg Good Jackson. Year. Yeah, I didn't forget his name. I was I was looking at something else here, uh, folks. Uh, GregJackson.com, two G's. GregJackson.com. God love him. Uh, brilliant author, brilliant man, uh, and also Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, another brilliant man. I, I think he's brilliant. He certainly is motivated, and his website PTSalt.com and SaltAndLightBrigade.org, and, and um, uh, both. Well, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, as we did that show last night, Joe. I mean, June fourteenth. Well, noon to three, 60th anniversary of the insertion of uh, under God in the in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to be in Washington D.C. in solemn prayer in front of the Supreme Court. Yeah, way to lock us in for that one. Well, <laughs> y- yeah, and well, you know, I'll tell you something, okay? And and we're no, it's a, it's definitely something that we need to yeah. need to do, and um, it's very important. It, it is. Coach Dave said no. Speakers know, you know, it um, doesn't matter, you know, who you are when you're there. You're just another person there praying for that's uh, right. the Lord to move. Yeah, exactly. And the fa- and that's what I do like. No rally, no uh, speaker, nobody on the dais. Everyone's standing shoulder to shoulder. And, and, you know, it would be my dream to have... Uh, representatives or senators there on the, of course I you know I wonder if that would ever happen but standing shoulder to shoulder with Christians and conservatives and patriots and it doesn't matter who you are you're at the same level and uh yeah no no speakers just presence just your presence and if we can overwhelm overwhelm the area but, but it wouldn't matter if there was 330 or 3000 I'd like to see it you know Tens of thousands, but uh, I think it's a great initiative, and I think it would send a, a statement. It would send a, just a tremendous statement. But more importantly, it would uh, it would it's an appeal to God Almighty. And, and isn't that really what it's all about? 
Mm-hmm. We can move mountains that way. And then we, of course, uh, uh, Steve Quayle with Ross Powell this week. And we're going to be following up on that, about the criminalization of cash and, and what's going on here with respect to um, the economy. Because you got news on that boy, today. Yeah. Denmark, the next country to go cashless. If you remember, India went cashless not too long ago. Today it's been announced that Denmark, and, and i got to check – Recheck the facts on India. Denmark is set to become the first country in the world to make cash payments obsolete. Hmm. But I thought India did that uh, a year or two ago. Well, what we what we're seeing here, um, whether it is the privatization of the internet. Now, some people might object to that terminology. It may not be precise, but it's more of a consolidation or a centralization, um, because we all know. That if you've got, well, look at the media. You know, you, you Joe. What are the numbers? In 1985, it was printed on, on our brochure here. I don't have a brochure in front of me, but I, I think the were, ratings. No, no. Uh, there are six companies right now that control all of the media, everything you read, see, and hear in, in the corporate media. But in 1985, there are how many uh, different uh, hundreds? You know, hundreds of, of tens of hundreds. Thousands. Yeah, and I uh, I've been following every month. They release the new demo numbers and new numbers for audience attendance for these networks. And man, you should see MSNBC and CNN. <laughs> I mean, Fox, I guess by default, because they're I don't want to say they're the right side of anything, but well, they're considered. I, I suppose it's, the it's, it's even is. more deceptive than the other ones because at least we know where they stand. Um, with Fox, they just uh, they're reporting to a um, a party base ideology instead of a belief system, and it's not the Lord's belief system either that they care about. Right. But um, we're talking like fifty thousand for prime time on MSNBC. In this quarter or this month, last month, uh, fifty thousand what? Listeners, yeah, viewers? like live li- listeners. Uh, it, I mean, horrendous wow. numbers. Wow. Yeah, that, that's pretty bad. How do they pay their bills? Well, GE owns them, which is owned by the government. So. Oh, okay. They just print the money. Well, that, that that's a good. Like all good that's, media that's, corporations. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's. Uh, oh wow. Um, I, I would like to. Continue also by by saying this. I this uh, t- today is our fifth broadcast from our new studio. We're still we're still having a, equipment installed. Now it was kind of a turnkey operation in the sense that that uh, we had some pretty heavy duty uh, um, we have already in in place ex- uh, big lines big lines to push audio and video out to bring it in, and uh, uh, that's being tweaked as certain things with respect to uh, uh, the audio levels of our guests. And let me ask a question for the listeners in chat. Has anybody had an unusually slow day trying to use the Internet today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to know that as well. It seems like we were throttled here today at the studios and our offices, which are interconnected uh, side by side. I mean, just going, uh, pulling up a simple website. Uh, and even at my home, actually. Downloading uh, audio clips for the, the show. Uh, it took like five minutes for YouTube to open. And just really strange things. And it's, it was all across the board, both studio computer laptops. Uh, right. Didn't matter what I was doing. It was, seemed to be running slow. So I just want yeah, to know if it's, it's something that's universal. Feedback. Or was the announcement that the Internet was going to uh, be dropped, the control of the Internet, be dropped by the USA? Uh, did they let some strings loose on, on the <laughs> uh, huh. not having to worry anymore about the controlling it now while they still have it until they hand it over? Yeah, I, that, that would be interesting to hear from you folks. Um, there's uh, three yeses. Okay, all right. Yeah, there's there's something not right here with this, and this is the other part we're going to get into talking about the internet. Um, I do want to warn people. I brought our studio dog or our dog into the studio. Uh, she's napping right now, but if you hear a yap, that's uh, 
hey, you know what, uh, she's part of our family and uh, um, she might have something to say. Uh, or but, she might be scared of her shadow, well, which she sometimes yeah. gets to, and she does... Uh, she, she well, got a. She had a she's developed a very high pitched bark when she barks and you're not expecting it. Oh Jumped. yeah. I mean, with yeah. our old dog King, it was so deep and loud it just it wasn't the startling type really. Oh, it was more like thunder. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but at any rate, so uh, I'm not going to make any apologies because yeah, you know what? Uh, a day in the studio. It's she had to check things out. Uh, now that we have all the all the cables uh, pretty much off the floor and. Um, but anyway, uh, so a, a good a good show planned for you this evening. A lot of information we we want to provide to you. Um, we do, we've done a lot of research, but I, I, again, I just want to say that you know this is day five in the studio, and uh, still getting used to the the surroundings and the switches and the and everything, and we're still having upgrades being done. So, uh, so with, what do you think, like? 2017, you'll be. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. This weekend, uh, we're, we're going to be spending a lot of time doing things. Now, the uh, the real uh, the real not- notable audio equipment that's going to uh, make a big difference in terms of callers and in terms of uh, volume control. Volume control is that will be flying probably. In a couple of weeks. Um, now we just have to learn how to use it. Yeah, well, and it's 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 kind of a big technical thing going on here, but uh, hopefully within the next several days, what we'll do is create some videos that will include um, uh, showing everyone the studio that really you've all that, that that's that's owned by all of you, and. Uh, uh, Putting out some informational videos as well, because we've got to hit the ground running. And I was talking to Joe, and you know, it, it's it's a very tiring process to to get things going. And I mean, it's it's to to, to build from the ground up, um, or not from the ground up, but to to really put things together. It's just it, it you know, it's just us. I mean, so much more space. I get tired by the time I get to my desk. And even <laughs> yeah. And of course, we've got our entire volume, our entire library, now uh, within arm's reach. Uh, well, I shouldn't say within arm's reach, but our entire library is covering one wall. Um, it looks nice know, too. Yeah, it, it is. It's pretty good. So, in, in a conference area, and uh, so 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 a lot of good things taking place. But so if we sound tired, we are. And uh, but I, I just kind of want to give a, a, an update about that. But there's so much going on. And I also want to drive home the point that uh, we are expecting, we, we can see the writing on the wall, we're expecting some sort of censorship with respect to the Internet. Now, we don't know if it's going to be a year, a month, a week, two weeks. We don't know when, but we are making plans to uh, for alternative ways. And when we're ready, we'll announce them. And, and we'll announce them at the same time. Uh, we, we have to be very... Uh, uh, Kate, not KG, but very strategic about mm-hmm. making announcements because we don't want to to show our hand to the enemy. And, and, the, and, the, and we say the enemy. Well, who's the enemy? Well, the people that, that don't want the truth out there. Of and course. that could be because we have a very strong hand or we're bluffing. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't... I, I, you know what? Thinking of it in poker terms. You're right. And, and You just don't know. Well... Yeah, we'll we'll say that, <laughs> but we don't. Bl- uh, well, it's almost uh, uh, we don't want to seem like we're self-serving, nor do we want to seem seem like we're bluffing at, at all, uh, especially to the listeners, because we want to be as transparent as possible. But to the enemy, yeah, let them let them wonder, right? Um, with us, which is all the stuff is temporary. We figure out what the weaknesses are, what the vulnerabilities are, and we build from there. Yes. Uh, moving into the studio was the first step of many we needed to take to yes. properly expand and become more efficient. And, and that's the thing, too. Um, there's this level of expectation from from us uh, as stewards, you know, f- for those who have supported us and are supporting us. We are very, very cognizant, very aware that, uh, you know, we 
the way I look at it and the way Joe looks at it is um, those of you who have support are supporting us and have supported us, we are answerable to you in terms of, well, you know, were you good stewards? Are you being good stewards? And we're very conscious about that. And there's nothing that we do or buy or uh, invest or whatever you want to call that um, without a lot of prayer and a lot of preparation and, and you know a lot of do we need this and is this the way to go and will this serve us today and into the future whatever if it's a piece of equipment or whatever but it's to uh, better to get our message out to reach a wider audience and, and to make the listening experience and soon the audio visual experience a, a much better one for for you and um I never thought, never planned on being here. Had no intention, no intention on being here whatsoever, in terms of where we're at with with this show. But God has blessed us with a with an opportunity, with a forum, a venue, and uh, and, then, and uh, we have to we have to awesome <laughs> listening audience. Yeah, very much, and it's because of all of you that that uh, you know we're all in this together. We really are, and. Man, I'll tell you, um, today, this morning, uh, as I usually do, I um, I leave my home and, and I'll you know I'll take my my dog and we'll, we'll walk and we'll uh, play ball a little bit and that gives me time to think. I mean, that's why I start my day, whether it's five o'clock or six or seven or eight o'clock in the morning, depending on you know, it doesn't matter. And, and just thinking about the awesome responsibility that I think we have to you and uh, just talking from the heart now um, you know when we did investigative work we got paid for the investigative work we did and for, and I remember working for a client one time and it was a huge client in, in our town and I, I'm not going to mention the name but it doesn't uh, matter they're out of business here anyway aren't they? no here no, 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 oh, no, huge, huge, huge client. And was this before my time? Yes, it was before your time. And I remember doing an investigation, and they hired my company and us, me, as an investigator to to uh, to investigate an issue of liability. And it was an insurance company, okay. And it was a very ex dense of loss. I'm talking about at the time uh, probably two two point five million dollar loss exposure, and <clears throat> their client, a corporation, uh, at issue was their was was their client. You know, was it, was there any, any liability on their client's part, or, or and hence their part? Well, come to find out. Yes, I, I mean they their client was in the wrong, and um, it, it was a it was a corp, it was a corporate deal and pretty convoluted, pretty pretty intense. So when when I did the investigative report showing step by step that their client, and hence their company, had a level of exposure, that was not what they wanted to hear. That was not what they wanted to see in writing. And I remember getting called into the uh, CFO, uh, well, the, the boardroom. There there were a couple of pretty high-ranking, well, the high-ranking corporate officials. And they said, we can't accept your report. And I said, well, why not? Well, this, this report... Um, Exposes us to a two. At the, I'll say it was like two point two five million dollar liability. And I said, "Well, that's that's this is the truth. This is what happened. I mean, this. You asked me to, to investigate this. We did. We, you know, we here's the evidence, the documentation showing where you've got this exposure. And they said, "Well, basically, how dare you?" put us in this position. What do you expect? They're an insurance company. Well, it's the truth. See, they, they, what they wanted was... They don't want it the truth. They want right. to, be, to be saving money. Exactly. Exactly. And I remember like it was yesterday 
the one man and he looked at me and he said, you're never going to get another piece of business from us again. And he said to me, you'll never, uh, well, you'll never, as as long as I am around, uh, you'll never work for any of the companies that were so with the subsidiaries, our subsidiaries. And I said, well, so be it. I mean, the truth is the truth. And if you, if this goes to court, which it was headed right to court, you know, I'm not going to testify to something that uh, is untruthful. And but so the reason I mention that is because that's the way I feel. I feel the responsibility to to, to the listeners. You know, sometimes the truth is uncomfortable, and sometimes the truth is not what you want to hear. But wouldn't it be better to know? than to be surprised. And, and we can spin it in a way where it's almost okay. <laughs> well, who wants to spin anything, you know? <laughs> you know? I'm just kidding. Oh, no, no. That speaks to the uh, level of insanity that the mainstream media companies work at. Um, regardless of the issue, they always have their personal spin. and um, I mean, they can take a, a, one factoid and spin it a hundred different ways and just shred any resemblance of the truth right out of it um, or, yeah. you know, real reasons behind them. Um, it's all manipulation. It's all distraction, deception. Um, what's the, I mean, think about this. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was delayed by the Democrats for whatever reason. Boom, that night Amtrak train crashes. The Amtrak train story takes up the headlines of every front leading and back end story for every news agency, uh, every paper, publication, for days, and what do they do? They sneak that uh, that uh, vote back in. And you don't hear a peep about it. That's right. It, it's it, almost it, like it was planned. <laughs> well, they, they they use the cover of the, uh, of course, blood leads. Um, you know, if it bleeds, it leads is the mantra of the media. What do you mean we're handing over control of the internet? Look, ISIS. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's yeah. how it goes. Uh, uh, Obama, release your birth certificate. Killed Bin Laden. Yeah, two point three trillion dollars missing. Oh, nine eleven. Yeah, there you over go. Over and over again. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of things. Again, I, I just, um, well, just to recap, I just want to say thank you to everyone, and we want to say thank you to everyone. And uh, you'll see a, 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 just a hope. Well, not hopefully, but it's our intent uh, and our objective to really. Uh, to really be pushing out some very quality, uh, uh, pro- very quality product, truthful and comprehensive to all our listeners, our readers, and ultimately our viewers. Uh, next week, you've got we've got a pretty good week planned. We have to. Um, we have ha- more than half. It's scheduled Monday. Augusto Perez Monday. Right? Yep, he's going to be with us on Monday. Stan Dale will be our guest Tuesday. G. Edward Griffin will be coming on. Wednesday, um, we're waiting to hear back from Mr. Jonathan Kahn and a few others uh, who we contacted. So, and we had some listener input uh, asking for Russ Dizdar, L.A. Marzuli, and um, there was one other one in there I can't think of at the moment. But um, yeah, we will uh, definitely work to get uh, Russ and L.A. Uh, back on the show. Right, and, and G.A. Yeah. Griffin is going to be on for. Perhaps half the show, an hour, hour and a half. Who knows? Uh, but but he's always a, a pleasure to interview, to talk with, and uh, we're gonna get his take on on where things are with the Fed, with the dollar, with with the UN the, too. Yes, uh, I mean he, this guy has been at the forefront uh, of in the investigations before. Probably my dad was born investigating these um, agencies. That's a stretch, and, but okay. I mean, Thank I don't know how old that. he is, but. Um, he has a, a great body of work, and his books are uh, must-haves for those who are looking into these things. Exactly. Well, okay, um, a couple of things, too. Uh, well, we should start off with... George uh, Stephanopoulos donating to the Clinton Foundation. <laughs> the track going 107. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> the... Uh, the the amount of information right now is just is overwhelming, and, and, and I, I know I, I hope, uh, boy, I just hope, ladies and gentlemen, that you feel 
that you don't get overwhelmed with the, with the information, that you've got some level of stability knowing that when you hear what we're talking about, you, despite its weight, that you've got the um, centered, you're centered enough within the word and protected by the blood that you're, you're not... Um, uh, you're not suffering anxiety from it. Yeah, and I don't you know, know how many people are like me, and I don't know, Dad, but you go through, but uh, once it gets to that point, it's like my brain just unplugged. Yeah. Like I just, it goes into a default mode. Um, you know, looking at the news all day, trying to figure out what is important, trying to get the real information about the things that we are looking into, but being drowned out by, um, you know, other stories that have no, no importance or very little significance at the time. I, I usually just uh, unplug and start going back to um, healthcare legislation, and you know. And, and sometimes you just have to walk away. Yeah. Sometimes you have to walk away from it, uh, unplug, take your dog for a walk, um, a, a longer walk in my case, or or just go out and smell a flower. Go out and and uh, you know be with. The family, it's important, or, or, or spend some time in prayer, or read, you know, read the word. Whatever you've got to do, uh, just protect yourself from that self-destructive mode of, uh, of of just you know being so wrapped up in this. Now, it doesn't mean we can't fight. We can't you know take up the mantle and uh, you know and fight. But uh, sometimes, sometimes a rest is required. Um, mm-hmm. You know. And uh, before I forget, I have an announcement from Coach Dave. He sent this just before the yes, show. Yes, yes. Hey, Joe, please announce tonight that the Hoven trial has been delayed so that anyone traveling to Pensacola will not go. Uh, the Hoven filed a motion to dismiss the prosecution's request for more time to respond. Um, and he asked the listeners to pray that the case will be dismissed. So anybody who had plans to go to Pensacola, hold off on those because the trial has been delayed. Okay, so... Yeah, uh, those people intending on going to the 18th of May uh, start of the Hoven trial, please adjust your schedules. Know that that's not going to take place. Um, watch uh, and listen to Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, ptsalt.com, for updates on that. Um, I'd like to start out kind of in general, if I may. This... Um, this just in here, faith under fire, prison next step for American Christians, because I think that this addresses some of the issues that we talked about earlier this week and kind of a theme that's running and a theme that's going to extend into what we're going to be talking about tonight with respect to the Internet. Former Congressman Frank Wolf has warned that Americans' freedom of conscience is now under attack and it's mainly Christians with conservative values who are in the crosshairs of the new champions of political correctness. Now, this former congressman is 76 years old. He's seen things. He's been around. And he said pretty much what Coach Dovemeyer and Greg Jackson and others have said, and that's this. We as Christians will likely have to resort to civil disobedience because our views are increasingly considered intolerant now. Now let's uh let's go through this slowly here because we saw something on Steve Quill's site this week. Yes, we did. Pertaining to Romans thirteen, I don't know who the pastors were that were speaking on the video, but Pastor was it Butch Pa? Butch Pa was the uh, issued a, yeah. a uh correction, I guess you'd say. The guy on the the pastor on the video said, Well, we have to obey the authorities. God in, implements the authorities, and we have to obey them because we don't want to go to jail and we don't you know, want to go against that. Well, we have to understand there are earthly authorities, and then there's the godly authority. Um, and I like the, how Butch Paul made the comment that where they were reading from in the Bible was written from jail due to what would be called today civil disobedience. I mean, See, when Daniel isn't that was, yeah. when a decree was issued in uh, Babylon that all people had to bow down into the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> did Daniel uh, obey that law? No, he practiced civil disobedience. And how was that? Well, he only continued to worship the one true God. 
That's and when that turns right. into civil disobedience, jail is irrelevant. You, you know, it makes me think, too, about the bakers, the um, cake bakers, okay? Now, the Christian cake bakers who were um, made, forced, or forced out of business because they wouldn't cater to the homosexual uh, request or demand that they bake a cake for a homosexual wedding ceremony. It, it makes me wonder, and, and if you look in totality... See, I would make a cake. It well, would not have been pretty, though. No, we can't do that. But but, but see, uh, are there Muslim bakeries out there? Are there Muslim-owned bakeries? We saw this. The uh, Somebody went in and had tried to do the same thing as a joke. I believe a uh right a person posing or maybe was homosexual had a uh over overly uh he had a very pronounced l- homosexual lisp I guess you could he, say he was flamboyant yeah, shall we say that's the word and went into this uh, bakery there was a woman behind the counter I don't know if it was her bakery but they were muslim and I don't know what I didn't read the whole thing I just kind of skimmed through the video but so I don't know what the design was or what the wording was, but asked if they would make this cake. And the lady's like, "No, get out of here." Right. So and, that, and the story where, died there. Well, yeah. Where where are the the uh, where are the the people who are going after the Christians? They're not going after the Muslim bakeries, Muslim owned bakeries. Well, and, and I understand to, that. To be fair, how many homosexuals are, are going to go into a Muslim bakery when Muslims will? But the the. Uh, Right, I, I mean, I get they that. kill homosexuals. Yeah, I, I understand that, but, but but still, you would think even even on the numbers, even the numbers because the numbers are so perhaps low, uh, nonetheless, that does not doesn't make any difference. But certainly, um, the Islamic owned bakeries who are refusing are not the targets here. It's the Christians. So Frank Wolf. Um, and, and those people old enough will remember uh, he was a 17 term congressman from Virginia and uh, he said that when tolerance is demanded when orthodox Christianity is deemed intolerant and when government and even society fails to extend tolerance to people of faith we are headed down a perilous path now uh, no, let me ask this, this question sure uh, open ended, no need for response. Does it offend anybody that Christ- when Christianity is called intolerant? Does it bother you guys? Any Christians out there? Hmm. It shouldn't. I'm just asking. Yeah, r- r- right. R- rhetorically, yeah. Well, Wolf, during his 17th term, congressional uh, stay, of course, he was from Virginia, um, he was a champion for religious freedom throughout that time and since his retirement in this well this past January he's become a senior fellow of the 21st century Wilberforce initiative which advocates for religious freedom worldwide he delivered the May 7th speech at an event here or in uh, uh oh uh it, it was uh, the Harvard Center for American Political Studies he addressed or his address was called after Hobby Lobby, what is Caesar's and what is God's? That was the title of his speech. Uh, That's the uh, 2015 their annual conference, Law, Religion, and Health in America. Now, if, if you, you might have seen this, folks, the Christian Post reported that Wolf's main point was that freedom of conscience has long been understood as important for religious freedom, and our founding fathers had, had really believe that and I know that you can you can I, I know that some were theists and some were um most the, were deists. right. I, I I get that. And then others were evil. Well, Benjamin Franklin is an example. Well yes, but built in and I think by divine authority into the, the constitution of our fine republic, um was the freedom and remains so far as tattered as it is this freedom of conscience 
Well, I don't want to turn this into a bait, but I just want to make the point from reading the uh, Life of Washington and from reading uh, John Adams' diary, from what I gather, they understood that in the public realm they couldn't continue to be associated or pledging allegiance to the, the crown. But they had no... They didn't care if the crown got their money from taxation or uh, association here, as long as it wasn't something that got in the way of establishing their union and having their um, well, breakaway from I, two it. two separate issues. I understand. No, that. I'm just, it, it's just weird when you read the histories because it's confusing. It's almost like a, Dude, that's true. And and you know what even makes it more confusing if those people who like to watch the History Channel and the various subsets of the History Channel, the the various iterations of, of history one, two, three, you know, whatever American Heroes Channel and all of these different channels on television, you are going to get um, some revisionist history, some revised history, and I think it makes it even more uh, more confusing. Which, let me step backwards in addressing the uh, the issue with the internet tonight. There are so many people who depend upon the internet for information. Right now, today, in 2015, I, I, I would submit to each and every one of you, rather than, um, for example, use the Internet to search history about our founding fathers, about our Constitution, I, I would submit that uh, I, I go to the library, books, physical books. Use bookstores. Yes. Uh, really, um, to me... That's important. One of the things we did when we used to travel for investigative work, no matter where we went, we would always stop at any used bookstores that were in towns. That's right. That's how we compiled half the library we have. Uh, and we would find, I mean, treasures in those uh, older books that were written in the you know early 1900s, and that, that worth. I mean, be, be two dollars, you know, for yeah, 1984. You know, some uh, the big New foreign policy books. or I couldn't tell you how many political books that have been used as examples to show the plannings and the uh, next steps of these elitists came from, you know, these people. They write in their own books. Right. So few people choose to read them uh, for yeah. whatever reason. Like Henry yeah. Kissinger's latest book, New World Order. Uh, I have not read that one yet, but I'm sure there's some gems in there. That, that, that's right. Um so, so I would really recommend, where possible, uh, have good, solid uh, books from you know, you know, as, as old as possible. Because at some point, I do believe that the libraries will be deemed irrelevant, and uh, you know, the uh, I, I just in, in, in the so Bible easy. will be yeah. will be thrown out. It will be illegal. Yeah, we know that even the scripture says in prophecy that there will be a, a famine in the land, but it won't be for bread or water. It will be for the word of the Lord. Right. Well, getting back to what uh, uh, Wolf was talking about, he he referenced, and, and I found this very interesting, a subtle but insidi insidious trend in which the government is expanding into areas more likely to infringe upon conscious rights and. The trend was at the heart of the Supreme Court case involving Hobby Lobby. And I watched in, in almost real time, folks, if you go to the different uh, right-left uh, uh, forums on the Internet, uh, the, the progressive Marxist uh, communist ideology, those people adhered to that. Their heads were exploding with respect to the Hobby Lobby. And the conservatives, in many cases were addressing it superficially without really giving it a lot of thought and a lot of um, investigative research. But the uh, Hobby Lobby, in case you don't know what that's all about, it's a Christian-owned craft supply chain and Obama's birth control mandate, according to the Christian Post article, um, this being at the at issue with respect to the Hobby Lobby. The owners of the Hobby Lobby, the the Green family, who owns Hobby Lobby, they're very pro-life. The Obama regime sought to require them to pay for health insurance coverage for contraception 
for pills that could cause an abortion, basically. And what Wolf said was, we are witnessing the imposition of a new state religion. And he called it progressive liberalism as the religion. Now, I would take it a step further to say it's it's a Mar- Marxist uh, ideology or a communist ideology. We have a, a sound clip. I don't know when you want to play this. It's from 1984 from George Orwell. Yeah, why don't we do that now? I think I think that now's a good time, uh, folks. This is from actually, I think this is from the 2011. Tele- it was uploaded to YouTube from the movie 1984, I believe. Right, the movie. Okay, go ahead. Depends on you, and it depends on us. Don't let it happen. Uh, I mean, that, that's pretty uh, foreboding and pretty telling, but and it's true. I see a, a comment in chat. Did he say? Did he just say abolish the orgasm? If I had to take a guess, I would say that is a uh, symbolism for abolish real life, real time feelings, and um, everything's becoming, you know, uh, digital, computerized. Um, well, they're I, taking the joy yeah. out of. Uh, I don't know. It, I, I, I would. I, when I heard it, you know, I, I would put less emphasis or less, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus on that. But but look, uh, listen to that statement as it was meant. Uh, we we played it because of the uh, futuristic, you know, boot on the neck of the people or the head of the people, and I think that that's what we have to focus on. And it's telling, and 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 it's it's the. It's this tyranny. Right now we're under this soft tyranny. Uh, in some cases, a little harder tyranny, but the tyranny under the, the global governance is going to be severe. Um, so yeah. look at it that way. But, but look what at I was it trying to say is taking away the real-life experiences for virtual, um, phony, false type yeah. Well, everything is becoming virtual reality. I mean, Paul McGuire talks about it. Uh, we had uh, Ted Brewer talking about the holographic nature. Uh, uh, There's certain aspects of, of this this new world order where we're at today. Um, In the physical aspect, I keep seeing every once a week on Dredge or uh, any website that deals with the technological aspect, sex bots coming soon. Well, it, it's the really? versions of, of technology that that, um, and, I, and I think folks who are listening to this program tonight, who are of age and have teenagers at home, who play video games, those video games are becoming more and more realistic. Right, and take take that a step further with these sex bots. Who needs a wife? Who needs a companion? Who needs you know to have kids? Who needs? You never have to leave your mom's basement, or you never have to leave your. You, yeah, it, it's 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 really. We are we are uh, substituting real life experiences for virtual reality, and um, this is part and parcel to what's coming with the new world order. How we will be subjugated mentally and, and emotionally, or the emotional part of it too. Um, I mean, th- think of the the warmth in the those who are married. Or who are you know getting married? Think of the warmth of the touch of of your wife or your your husband. What 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 the what's happening now is is that warmth of the touch is now being replaced by this virtual reality, by this this false sense of uh, yeah. And the uh, the generation that is you know younger than me doesn't care about that companionship or, or uh, they. Uh, from what I understand and from what I can tell, you know how the divorce rates continues to increase. Uh, it was 50% 10 years ago, and now we, uh, it, I mean, people aren't even getting married until they're, you know, if they're getting married at all, they're getting married later and later and later in life. Um, yep. People don't sure. see that as a as a benefit or something that is good in life. They see it as a hindrance because everybody's so self-centered. They want to do what they want to do. There's no room for another individual or person and their needs and wants in their life. You know, sometimes we have to just step back and take it, make an assessment of what's really going on. And, and um, you know, this assessment that we're doing right now, although it seems off topic, I think is, is really at the heart of, of everything. Um, you know, where, how we're being subjugated, what we're, uh, the, the transhumanism, the transhumanistic uh, agenda, the implementation of the one world government, the new world order, the fact that, uh, you know, instead of 
being able to hold and trade in actual silver and gold coins in your pocket is now being uh, traded in for the digits on the computer screen. Um, we're, we're seeing this move from the real to the artificial, and and this this will uh, condition especially the younger generation. It has. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it it, it really. And part and parcel to that, the double standards of corporate America is going back to what, what this uh, former Congressman Wolf said. He pointed, for example, to the hypocrisy of corporate leaders. You, you can, you can uh, cite Apple CEO Tim Cook, who opposed the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, remember that, in Indiana and in other states. This is a trend that we must identify. Now, you you might not consider yourself religious. It doesn't matter. Uh, The fact that they are attacking, the the powers are attacking this, this, the the belief systems of conservative Christians. And see, uh, where I'm understanding now is it has to happen because religion in reality is is the problem. It's not the belief in our Lord and the uh, true believers. It's right. the false spirit of religiousness and legalism, religious legalism. So when that does fall, people will either uh, do what the Lord said. They're either going to be on fire for the Lord or they're going to be cold or lukewarm. And, and, and separating lukewarm the is people a dangerous place. But go who, ahead. who are on fire for the Lord from those who are lukewarm and for those who are... I mean, how many people would still worship the Lord if all the churches in America, the buildings were torn down tomorrow? Hopefully, all of our listeners, and I believe that to be the case. I, I, Absolutely. I think, you know. However, you've got that segment of society who. I mean, people would just put their Bible on a shelf, say, "Oh, that's it. <laughs> no more churches. What do we do?" And, and remember, Steve Quell saying, I, "I think I think he said this week where Bibles will be burned or they'll be outlawed," and and I believe that. I believe that's coming. I, I really believe. Well, yeah. Be, be, I mean, the scripture says it. Well, yeah, and, and not only that, the the move by the government to classify Christians who believe in Bible in the Bible not allegor not, not as an allegory, like I think what Bill O'Reilly, um, for example, you know, he's he's a mouthpiece for the so called so called mouthpiece for the so called conservatives, um, conservative Christians, right. Uh, saying, well, it's allegorical. Uh, okay, then you know, that, that's that's on the slope to eradicating the Bible because those who believe in the literacy, inerrancy of the Bible, will be considered archaic and, and even criminal criminals. So well, you know, we see how much the modern day churches and mega pastors have changed already the words that are in the Bible while they still have their Bibles there with them. That's right. Uh, they're of no use to those people unless, you know, there are people in those congregations who are still searching the truth. But when, I think it's in Romans 8, when you change the word of God into a lie, you nullify the actual word of the Lord. So what, I mean, the churches, as I said yesterday, um, everybody's so terrified of the Supreme Court decision. Well, we already lost the battle when our mainstream churches adopted the same-sex legislation like the Presbyterian branch and I don't know which other ones. Not all of them did. But those churches are are void now because they've already took the initiative upon themselves before there was a law to protect their tax-exempt status, Mm -hmm. I believe, to be politically correct, to conform to the world so they can gain, you know, they're converts, but they're not converts of, of Christ, most of them. Uh, I pray that all of them are. Well, you, you know, But once the church becomes more worldly, it becomes more attractive <laughs> to people who love the world more than they like the word of the Lord. And, and this is something, I, I didn't, we didn't plan on getting into this, but if I may just go on a tangent here. You, you know, um, one of the subtleties of Satan, one of the subtleties of um, as intellectuals, all of us, as, in, uh, as we are intellectuals, people with, with functioning minds, um, we are slowly being lied to through the revision of 
documents of, of history of uh but but one of the more and, and I'll use the word again insidious one of the more insidious things that we're seeing is the counterfeiting of the bibles today for example and again I wasn't planning on getting into this but I and, and I've spoken about this before but I really want to drive this home you know, one of the greatest me- or the greatest method of deception is to counterfeit, and the master of counterfeit and deception, of course, is Satan. If you look in the Bible, two Corinthians, uh, chapter eleven, verse fourteen and fifteen, warns of Satan con- uh, Satan's counterfeit. Now, uh, among his, and this is based on research. Now that we've done collectively, I've done individually, others have done. Really pay attention to this. How many different translations and versions of the Christian Bible are out there? There's many, right, Joe? I mean, I, you got the national or New International Version. You got the, uh, I mean, how many the King James Version, the, the New King James Version? Well, one of the paths that I, that took me in my investigative studies, my investigative research was about the New King James Version Bible. And I have concerns about this. Remember that DVD we were sent, the New World Order yes. Bible? Yes. It, went, it got into this in great detail, the differences, that, the changes that were made from the NIV to the New King James versus what was in the original. Yes. Uh, how many references to heaven or Well, yeah, or, I'll and, tell you right now, real quick here. If you have a New King James Version Bible, now, folks, you can make your own minds up, okay? As, as rational, sane... Uh, sharp intellectual people out there. You can make your own minds up. But I, I've got some questions with respect to the new King James Version of the Bible. Uh, a couple of things. The, the symbology that's there. If you look at um, the symbol that all new King James Version Bibles have, the because it's published through Thomas Nelson, Nelson Publishers. On the inside cover, the symbol there, there's a symbol and uh, we know that symbols are used throughout the occult and if you look at Harper's Encyclopedia of Myth, uh, Mystical and Paranormal Experience on page 594 symbols are important to all esoteric teachings for they contain secret wisdom accessible only to the initiated so right there that makes me think okay hmm, what's this symbol Thomas Nelson Publishers. Um, well, they claim on the inside cover the, the symbol uh, is an ancient symbol for the Trinity. And, and folks, if you've got a New King James version of the Bible, look at it. It's a uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word here. What it is? Uh, it's, it's a triquetta. Thank you, triquetta. It's a triquetta. It's used as well, it's, it's, it appears on the inside cover. The um, Bible, the King James Version, says that uh, in Acts chapter 17, verse 29, it clearly forbids symbology. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. Okay, So why does the Aquarian Conspiracy and New Age Handbook bear a very similar symbol as the New King James Version of the Bible? And if you look at that, a lot of New Agers freely admit it represents a interwoven a series of interwoven sixes or 666. Now, whether that's you believe that's the case, okay. I mean, it, 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 regardless, it is a triqueta uh, in terms of the logo. And the triqueta is used as the centerpiece for the logo of the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, ITP, which is a New Age school that follows the Jungian psychology. Now, that's after Carl Jung. And those people who know about uh, the psychiatrist Carl Jung, he was an occultist. One of the stated goals is to reach the recognition of divinity within, okay, so there's something there about the symbol. But moving on, if you uh, uh, if you actually just stay away from that, and I know that we're getting close to the top of the hour here, 
uh, even moving on past that, past the logo. And there are so many other examples. Uh, books written by former Satanists, such as Blood on the Doorpost. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, but former Satanists, I should say. Uh, Bill and Sharon Schneblin wrote Blood on the Doorpost, documents the trio of sixes in the New King James Version symbol. And goes, they even say it's symbolic of the Antichrist. But beyond that, again, moving past that, um, the preface on the new or to the New King James Version of the Bible reads, and I'm going to quote this. Uh, it reads, a special feature of this New King James Version is its conformity to the thought flow of the 1611 Bible. The new edition, which is much clearer, are so close to the traditional. So that kind of what that says is, hey, don't worry, we're conforming to the to the spirit of the 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 actual 1611 uh, Bible, version of the Bible. But among the first changes that greets the reader of the New King James Version is the removal of certain words that have meaning, and, and words do have meaning, the, thou, and ye, for example. Now, in the New King James Version, they state that the, thou, and ye are replaced by the simple you, because why? Well, the pronouns are no longer part of our language. But the thou and ye, if you go back and look at history, they weren't part of the language during the 1611 time period either. Just read just read the uh, 1611 King James Bible. There were not the thou and ye in the introduction. All right, but anyway... Um, moving on here, uh, it's the intent of the New King James Version to make the old King James Version much clearer by updating obsolete words. Okay, well, how about the word hell? You see, the New King James Version removes the word hell 23 times. 23 times. Do they replace it with anything? Or anything? Yeah, they replace it with Hades and Sheol. Okay. Okay. Now, if you look up, uh, if you right here, I've got a copy of Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary. Well, what's Hades? Well, Hades is the underground abode of the dead in Greek mythology. Right. You didn't have the uh, what they call Abraham's bosom, where before the Lord was resurrected, the those who were dead in the Lord were separated from uh, those who weren't. So they Correct. have different meanings. Yeah, so I, what I'm saying, so another one of these obsolete words is repent. Now, this is important, too. The word repent in the New King James Version is removed 44 times. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Um, the, the new term, uh, or the term New Testament is not in the New King James Version. Okay. Uh the New Testament is replaced with New Covenant. Now, some people can see that as say, well, that that's marginal. No, that's really an assault on the written word. Uh, also removed are the words that damned, damnation, condemned is has been it's been replaced with condemned, but it's nowhere near as serious as damned. You can condemn someone but not damn them. Or a person can be condemned but not damned. Um, Romans 14, verse 22 is one example there. And I won't get into it. But there are so many absurd changes uh, that are very subtle. Uh, very, very subtle. The um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Again, I wasn't planning on going here. But there are so many revisions, so many changes. Let me just give you, I think, one more, one or two more example examples here. By the way, the triquetta, or yeah, triquetta. If you want to know what it looks like, if you're old enough to remember those, uh, remember the the 45 records that uh, uh, we used to have, and, and then you put those plastic things in the center to to make it fit on the turntable. Yeah, 
most most some of you know what I'm talking about. That's that's kind of the version of the triquetta. Okay. So if you want to know what that looks like, if you don't have a King James, a New King James Version Bible right there. So um the moreover the the reason I bring this up is because uh, we are being subtly things are, are changing very subtly in I, I uh, for example the New King James Version removes the word Lord sixty six times it removes the word God fifty one times it removes the word heaven fifty times in just the New Testament alone. The New King James Version removes 2,289 words from Old King James Version. They make over 100,000 word changes. And if you look, if you, by comparison... The Queen James Bible only has eight. <laughs> so, yeah, the, here, the point is, as we, as we uh, now just breeze through the top of the hour, the point is this... To be lied to, it doesn't have to be uh, it, it, the more insidious lies or, or, in fact, the more subtle lies. So we have to be always paying attention. And today, more than ever, be a lot more wary of what we're being exposed to. We think we're doing right, and we think we're, you know, we're on the right path. We think that uh, we're, we're doing... Uh, you know, we actually have God's book in our, you know, God's word in our hand. Wow. So look at what is taking place and uh, see how see how the word is being counterfeit. See how we're see how the truth is being molded and counterfeited. And I just want to bring that up because that to me is something important that I think people need to understand. But you're listening to a Friday edition, a follow-up Friday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Interestingly, we will get into. Uh, well, interestingly, we got off on that tangent, but uh, we will be getting into some very important aspects of what will be affecting you, all of us, with respect to the Internet, as well as other issues related to the New World Order on the other side. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of this Friday, May fifteenth, 2015, we have a bunch of news we're going to get into this hour. Uh, and we are going to switch gears. We were going to talk about the Internet news first, but we're going to talk economic news, because I just found came across something uh, right before the show that was very interesting. China's yuan may draw $1 trillion on getting IMF reserve status. At least $1 trillion of global reserves will switch to Chinese assets if the IMF endorses the yuan as a reserve currency this year, according to the standard chartered uh, PLC and AXA investment managers. People's Bank of China officials have called for the IMF to include the yuan in its reserve basket, which consists of the dollar, the euro, pound, and yen. In a review late, uh, later this year, an inclusion could spar as much as 6.2 trillion yuan of net purchases of China's offshore bonds by the end of 2020, uh, according to estimates. Managers say about 10% of the 11.6 trillion in global reserves will flow into yuan assets. It didn't give a time frame. What is significant is the seal of approval by the IMF that the yuan has internationalized as reserve currency, Aidan Yao said, the senior emerging market economist at AXA Investment, said in a briefing in Hong Kong Thursday, it could trigger a reallocation of global reserve portfolios. Now, what does that all mean? Because to me, that, that's a whole bunch of words, but The dollar has 41.9% in the SDR basket currencies. The euro has 374 this according to the IMF, pound 11.3, the yen 9.4%. The yuan can get a potential weighing of about 13%, according to an, an estimate from the Bank of Merrill Lynch in March. HSBC Holdings PLC said it in April, note that the yuan share could be as high as 14%, reflecting China's importance in global exports. SDR inclusions in 2015 would likely have a significant market impact, driving immediate sharp increase in global diversification into renbini assets. Remimbi. Remimbi. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Remimbi. Remimbi. But it says uh, the Remimbi broadly meets SDR criteria. Standard chartered analysts, including Beckley Lau and Eddie Cheng, wrote in a research paper Friday, even if the decision is to include the Remimbi, it's deferred. We see a higher degree of certainty for inclusion in 2020 or possibly earlier via the interim review. But um, 
what this means is less room for the dollar in that basket of SDR reserve currencies. Okay. And therefore, it would be um, it would not hold as much value as it does now. They're part of the market share. Uh, a lot of the, the U.S. dollar's wealth is what not backed on gold. That was taken away. As you say, it's backed on the fact that it's a petrodollar. Right. But as the countries are moving away from the dollar, um, the IMF is also uh, continuing to expand their basket currencies for the world reserve currency status. And, it, you know, when we get to a point where somebody is equal with us or higher than us, then there goes our cheap gas prices, our food. And I don't know if this is uh, this is kind of not off topic, but uh, more speculative. From what I heard about what could happen with this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement once it's passed is it opens up a market for farmers in the United States to uh, sell globally. Therefore, food prices will... Remember when Nathan talked about his dream he had and he's standing in the supermarket? Yes. A pound of hamburger, I saw, they said it would be like 20 bucks. Right. Milk would be like $10, $15. Kind of the same exact thing as he was saying uh, came up in uh, what some economists were speculating about on different forums, saying well, that this, uh, once the global market, once the uh, TPP goes through, the ability for U.S. farmers uh, is not just to sell to people in the U.S. They have a, a world uh, market now. Well, well, here's what all of this brings us, me back to, and I think you and I spoke about this earlier. And, and folks, I, I would really recommend not blowing this off, okay? Because um, I, I do believe world leaders, members of the IMF, uh, leaders of, well, who, who's the IMF chief right now? Lagarde. Christine Lagarde. If you go back to January 2014, and, and people, you know, people laugh this off, but as we said earlier, words do mean things. Remember that speech delivered that she delivered at the National Press Club in January 2014. If her words didn't mean anything, I mean, what, what, what's going on here? Um, if you look at the references that she made, and, and I'm going to turn it back over to you, Joe, but um, there was a, a I mean, just a, a bizarre speech by IMF leader Christine Lagarde in January 2014 at the National Press Club. And you can look this up. You can find it on the Internet. But um, one minute, 22 seconds into her speech, and, and the speech seemed to center on occult numerology. Uh, one minute, 22 seconds. Now I'm going to test your numerology skills by asking you to think about the magic seven. Okay? 134. Most of you will know that seven is quite a number. 224. 2014. You drop the zero. 14. Two times seven. Now, these are her words, not mine, not ours. 420 or 408. It will mark the 70th anniversary. 70th, 70th anniversary dropped the 07 of the Bretton Woods Conference that actually gave birth to the IMF. Now she's talking there about the birth of the IMF, the 70th anniversary, or reducing that number down to 7. 438, it will also mark the 7th anniversary of the financial market jitters. 508, and those 7 miserable years, weak and fragile. 514, we have seven strong years. And it goes on and on and on about seven. W why? Why is why did Lagarde bring up the numerology? Is Was that some sort of a message just for those initiates in the know? Is numerology, in this case, real? Is it nonsense? I don't believe it's nonsense at all. Well, numerology is, you know, uh, the Lord has purpose for, for numbers, right? And, so does Satan. Yeah, and um, you know we see numbers in you know six 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 in the Bible. Um, number seven, the you know seven days in a week um, what was it jubilees every fifty years. There's all these cycles, all these numbers, and it is there are things to this. You know we see the 
letters and, and numbers are just uh, symbols that communicate things. And I've been doing some studies on, on uh, you know, languages and the origins of languages, and it originated from symbols, like a football team. You see a logo of a football team, you don't need to see the word spelled out because that logo represents a word in your mind already. Right. Yes. So, I mean, there there is uh, uses that we don't even comprehend most of the time when these things are being said and done in purposes we are unaware of. Well, and, and, and uh, yeah, and look, not to stray too far, but Jonathan Kahn, the Harbinger, and, and the uh, mystery of the Shemitah, and, and now, if have you noticed the um, the two heifers born with the sevens I've never on, on their head? That. Yeah, yeah, I, the red red heifers. Well, the perfect uh, heifers, you know, but uh, born on the same day with the number seven. Is there a, a biblical verse for that or an application in the Bible to this? You, you know, um, I'm hesitant to even oh, get yeah. into that only because of, uh, you know, the tangents we can go down. But but the fact is, um, you know, Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF, in that unusual, very uh, cryptic speech before the National Press Club, and, and some people might consider this old news, but a lot of times, folks, the the um, speeches like this are are meant for the initiates and meant for a future date, a future time, and it's strange. And I, I would urge people not to blow this off. I mean, you could also take this. I mean, you could use a similar numerology. Uh, when we talk about the down Malaysian flight, and, and people have short memories, it, really, we all do, because we're getting hit left and right by headlines. But, but the down Malaysian flight, the aircraft, a Boeing seven seven seven, it was flight seventeen. It crashed on seven seventeen fourteen. Of course, fourteen is seven, uh, two sevens. The maiden flight crashed. Uh, uh, well, of the crash aircraft. Occurred on seven seventeen ninety seven, okay. Um, and if you look, uh, that was the first time. Let me, let me clarify that: the aircraft that crashed, the Malaysian flight, flight was first put into service on seven seventeen ninety seven. And, and if you do numerology there, you know seven seventeen ninety seven. If you Ninety seven is nine plus seven, that's equal to sixteen. You'd reduce it further to one plus six is equal to seven and it's interesting because the aircraft had seventeen years in service. Now you you might think, well we can we can get numbers from anything. Yeah, we can. But to this extent, um you know, I think we have to look for patterns uh, if we want to understand the playbook of the of the enemies. Um Occult, uh, occult Gematria. So, I guess the reason I mentioned this is because um, all of this, to, when you combine this together, you can see where we're being taken, I believe. And we're being taken down this road of the occult. And whether we believe this or not, it, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to believe what they believe. But if they're the ones in power and they believe in numerology, and, and numbers mean things, and there's hidden messages, and the way they're, and, and if you look at images, and I've been doing this a lot lately, look at the images of of leaders, uh, their hand positioning, and uh, it's interesting because the, I do believe there are messages being sent to those who know what to look for. And we can glean from this some level of knowledge, I believe, that yes, there is communication in the open that only the initiated understand. Yeah, plans are being made right in the open, right in front of us. And they're laughing at us because, you know, we don't know. I mean, we're not informed. We don't have their playbook, at least not all of it. So... Anyway, um, I would watch these these various messages, and, and uh, you know, it's easy for people to say, "Wow, you're really 
getting off on some whacked out tangent. But when you start talking about uh, the complexity of the financial system and the push toward this one world economic system, it's all being reduced to numbers anyway, right? Numbers on a on a computer screen. Uh, there is stuff here to uh, there is fertile ground for investigation and research. And we welcome all of your inputs. Uh many people have sent and and we want to thank every one of you for sending your takes on uh, your your investigative re, uh, research on this kind of thing. And and I think it's important uh, because we're trying to connect some dots, seemingly disparate dots. And, and it's our survival in, in a way. I mean, well, obviously our survival, we know where it comes from and we know, but but it, we can also mitigate our, our, our exposure to what's coming by understanding the playbook. And that's what we're trying to do. So, I, I thought I'd go off on a tangent as we see the yuan now uh, emerging. And Steve Quayle said something interesting about uh, China and gold when Ross Powell was on. The uh, heck, the talking points that, that we had, uh, not exactly the, uh, uh, we didn't cover them all, but uh, uh, the Chinese yuan SDR update. The IMF has stated that the yuan is fairly valued. The uh, Britain Lee openly stated that they supported the yuan inclusion in the SDR. China is continuing to push it. Um, end of May recommend, uh, for recommendation and November for final vote to be effective one of uh, January of 2016. In other words, uh, meaning that uh, uh, we're looking at a pretty rapid transition. I believe into a uh, removal of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. Well, they are, and just to go a month back from the same uh, publication, Bloomberg.com, where we just talked about and read this article about the yuan. This talks about uh, what will happen. It says quantitative easing is helping Europe achieve its economic targets, but it's also undermining the long-term value of the euro as the as a global reserve currency. Central banks cut their euro holdings by the most on record last year in anticipation of losses tied to unprecedented stimulus. Now the euro accounts just for 22% of the worldwide reserves, down from 28% a year ago, while the dollar and yen climbed. As a reserve currency, the euro is falling apart. As long as you have full quantitative easing, there is no need to invest. The problem for the moment is we don't see a floor for the currency. Money is flowing out. Global reserve managers may be thinking the euro is going to sink economically if this continues this way. They may be expecting Japan's economic growth to continue as a result of that. But here's what um, they say happens. Um, most of the fall in the euro shares, uh, rather than simply reflecting the declines in the exchange rate, they are um, adding to the declines, the euro weakening. Um, so as we continue the printing presses here, backed by nothing, huh. printing paper that you know is worthless, calling it something of value. China has been buying up gold. They, through our, our uh, trade agreements, have been able to um, take over the manufacturing and are now the manufacturing capital of the world where we were since the Industrial Revolution up until NAFTA was implemented. And they have been able to and will continue to push a gold-backed currency, which is much more attractive to financial people when considering a reserve currency because their currency has the collateral to back it up. It's like would you give a loan to somebody who had, you know, would you give a $100,000 loan to somebody who who didn't even have a car or even a tire to back up their loan? Or would you go with somebody who had, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand worth of supplies that they could sell if they needed to have the money? Well, that's a no-brainer, right? And this is the same kind of um, what we're seeing here. And, and not only that, but not only are we not correcting our ways, we're continuing to diminish the value of our currency through uh, the continuation of these programs. Right. Now you see the negative interest rates and deposit fees and 
banks looking for measures, you know, when you can't even go to the bank and take out um, a couple thousand dollars without getting, you know, tackled, uh, SWAT teamed and, and taken by the IRS, there's a problem. Yeah, you know, two stories or two two real life accounts that are uh, not connected, but I think it's important for people to hear, uh, exclusive to to the Hagman and Hagman report. Um, I'll go with the more relevant one here as a segue. Uh, I, I I had the occasion once once again to speak with a uh, an individual who I'm who I've become friends with at the bank at our local bank, and and I had a conversation and um, about withdrawals, cash withdrawals, and and, and this individual knows. Um, my feelings, and, and no, it, this person knows pretty much what's going on. And I was told, and, and folks, take this for what it's worth. I mean, this this is not secondhand or you know, friend of a friend. This is coming directly from a, a, a bank manager who said that they they've been instructed by the federal government, and, and we're talking within the last, uh, I'll say, sixty days. I'm not exactly certain of the time, but it was definitely within the last sixty days. To um, to number one, discourage people from taking cash out of the bank. The tellers, for example, if you they don't even keep enough money in the bank um, for right. people to take it out. So just they used to, but and say they didn't have it. Now they don't even keep it there, so they can't even you know lie about it. Well, right. I mean, just as, a, as anybody who has, like, we'll say, fifty grand in the bank, uh, which is not Obama. Uh, yeah. Go in just just as a, a practicing. You don't want to take out twenty five grand or whatever, but just go go in your bank without calling ahead and ask for that twenty five grand, just to see what they say. You're not going to get it anyway, but just go in. Well, right. And the the uh, this branch manager said that. Uh, and if you uh, can get it taken. Yeah. Well, if you're fortunate enough to have that kind of liquidity, but the um, the branch manager said that they were instructed by the. Uh, uh, federal government to discourage actively discourage people from taking large ca- cash withdrawals, and this happened within the last sixty days. And to to ask questions, ask why? Why are you taking the money out? And for example, if if it's for a vacation, let, let's say you're traveling to Florida or you're traveling to Las Vegas or you name the place, they are to encourage the uh, customer to use plastic, to use the, the uh, debit card or credit card, whatever, the ATM card as the method of uh, uh, purchase or, you know, to, to, to in, in place of cash. And if, and this is the important part, if the customer is insistent or if the customer if it's not a, let's say it's not, tra- you know, you're not traveling. If the customer is making a more um, than one or two uh, cash withdrawals per week, they are to report them via the SARS, the Suspicious Activity Reporting, uh, to the federal government. Now, you don't. That does not mean that you'll ever know that you're being reported, but this confirms what we've been saying. And in this, over the last 60 days, this has become much more aggressive. This directly from, uh, stated directly to me by the manager of a relatively large bank um, throughout the United States. So, is this why you get kicked out of banks? Sometimes? Yes, I, this is the exact reason why I'm not allowed in some banks. Or, you know, they, they have yeah. pictures of them on <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they don't have pictures, but like when you go into grocery store, sometimes, especially in, in uh, less uh, in poorer neighborhoods, uh, and the one I used to live by, they had a whole wall of pictures. You know, this guy stole a loaf of bread. This guy, he's in the banks. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't even say he stole anything. It just said no, no, no. no it's yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, Joe's being funny, but but seriously, I. In a couple of banks, I'm not welcome because of my my uh, uh, righteous anger toward the the system itself. And, and well, that's it where known. it starts. 
yeah. Okay. Well, I just want people to be aware that you you probably will be placed on the uh, you, there will be a report filed against you. Not that you'll ever know it, but uh, data is being collected on your transactions, and it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be five thousand dollars. It could be as little as two thousand dollars. The information I got was two thousand dollars, which is consistent with what uh, Ross Paul and Steve Quayle said on Wednesday. So just keep that in mind. Not that you're trying to hide anything, but at what point? It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't it, matter. I mean, if you are trying to hide anything, the the burden. If you're doing something wrong, they have to prove you're guilty. You're innocent until proven guilty, but not in our system anymore. That's right. Not right. in our, and it's not even just in the economic sector. It's all across the board. Um, I saw. I want to get back to the, the Denmark piece real quick, but there is an article today about the um, people being sick and tired of these checkpoints inside U.S. borders. This from Watertown Daily News. North County residents yes. have mixed views on U.S. border patrol checkpoints. North Country residents have strong opinions and mixed views about the value of traffic checkpoints routinely set up by U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents assigned to monitor the American side of the U.S.-Canadian border. Uh, no, hold, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. I, let me just clarify this. Joe, you and I spent a lot of time up in Watertown. Watertown, just to give people an idea. Uh, Fort Bragg? Or uh, Fort Drum? Fort Drum, that's right. It's where Fort Drum is. It's, if you, I mean, it's the... It's an hour north of Syracuse. It's yeah, and it's right. It's near the Canadian border. It's a uh, it's a town that I mean, you go through. Uh, uh, you take what is it? Eighty one. Eighty one. Okay, you take eighty one from Syracuse up. Uh, before you hit Canada, you run into Watertown, and Watertown is this uh, city, if you will. It's a small city. It's kind of spread out, um, but it it's it's kind of like a city in the middle of. The, the country, yeah, uh, a city that guards a military base or it, it, hides a military yeah. and base. And Joe, you and I spent many, many, many hours up in Watertown, yep. uh, uh, up in that area. And this is where this is coming from. I just want people to, to know that we've been there and we've worked cases. I wouldn't brag about that. <laughs> well, uh, Ogdensburg. We worked cases in Ogdensburg, and uh, that's north of Watertown, just to give you an idea of the area. But this is important because, uh, I mean, this backdrop is important because this is happening not just there. And if it ha- if it can happen there, and it is happening there, it will happen where you live. Remember the 100-mile constitution free zones? Any yes. Anyone within 100 miles of a border is in a constitution free zone? Yes. Um, we see this mostly in the southern border. There's, been, there's lots of YouTube videos on how people get through the checkpoints by um, politely refusing to, to answer any questions except asking the question, can I go? Um, but but look, that depends on the, the how, what kind of data cops are having. But listen to what Joe's going to say, because listen to these responses by the Watertown Ogdensburg residents. This yeah. is important. And, and think about this. Now, they're, they're still keeping these checkpoints up in high volumes, even though they're allowing the illegal immigrants to come in. So it, it is uh, ridiculous. It, is, it makes no sense whatsoever. If the illegal immigrants are no longer illegal, what are the checkpoints for? And secondly, why... It's it's one thing if they're you know ten twenty miles away from the border crossing on the same road, but they're not. They're in the country on roads that are not border roads in the U.S. But they're going to say that based on a random interview, several say they believe border checkpoints are necessary to keep illicit drugs, illegal immigrants, and other unlawful activities out of the country. All things the government brings in openly. <laughs> but however, many are also concerned that too far or too many law enforcement officials, including the border patrol agents unlawfully stretch their authority by using aggressive tactics when interrogating law-abiding citizens traveling in their own country. Last week, Jessica Cookie, a 21 of Ogdensburg, was pulled over at a border checkpoint in Waddington by Border Patrol agents who wanted to search her car's trunk during an altercation that followed Ms. Cookie was allegedly subdued with a stun gun. The incident, which was captured on cell phone taken by Ms. Cookie, was... Well, we'll call her Cook. Yeah, yeah, we'll call her Cook. Oh, I'm sorry. That is good. Has prompted a spirited debate on social media sites 
uh, Cook, uh, S-U-N-Y, Canton, criminal justice major who graduated sa- uh, Saturday, claims she was wrongfully assaulted and threatened to file a lawsuit. She got, and she she got paid. She would win. Yeah. Several people say they believe both parties deserve some blame for their altercations. Cook, for provi- provoking agents with an uncooperative attitude, and the agents for using excessive force to restrain her. Well, just in my own comments, um, she has every right to have an uncooperative attitude. She was minding her own business. Uh, the you know Constitution, if we're going to go by that, that's allegedly the law of the land. Says you shall uh, be free to travel about. What happened to the molested. What happened to the uh, you know the Bill of Rights? Well, that's just the thing. They're irrelevant. Exactly. And, and, People don't understand that they're sitting here worrying about fighting for the Constitution, not realizing that that's like uh, you know. But the sampling of the opinion of the area residents and the people visiting should tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. And here goes with the sampling. William Hill Edwards said he was driven through checkpoints on several occasions, never had a problem. Usually agents ask drivers where they're from and where they're going. And my answer would be none of your business. Occasionally they ask drivers to pull over for further questioning or inspect their vehicle. I am for Border Patrol checkpoints. Look at the drugs seized weekly by these that would otherwise go right into the streets. Hill said in an email, if you have nothing to hide, why be a jerk? Just cooperate. Well, that's the well, idea. Sure. Will, Just cooperate. Uh, yeah. What do you have to hide? Right. Get, get your chip. Are you terrorists? <laughs> All right. Heather Wells, 29, of Ogdensburg, said her and her husband passed through checkpoints occasionally on Route 37. And we've been on that road many times oh, when yeah. they are heading to St. Regis Mohawk Reservation to purchase cigarettes. I think we're close to a border, so we should have checkpoints, Wells said. If you don't give them a reason to stop you, they won't. That's garbage. Yeah, they, you know, they don't have a reason in the first place. Uh, yeah, and just imagine an open road like um, 37 is just it's a very rural area uh, going out of Watertown towards uh, Ogdensburg and uh, 81, which is a which is, which is the interstate, but it's in the middle of nowhere. No, see, so yeah, I, I was in a good mood. Um, I didn't read this far down into the sampling. Oh, you got I read it. assumed the people were going to be outraged. Yeah. No, 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 no. How Keep about going. you read the next? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, in Watertown, Antonio, uh, let's see, Gigliotti said he does not consider road checkpoints set up by the Border Patrol to be any cause for concern. They don't bother me. Now. He said that he traveled through checkpoints before without an issue. He said that, and, and here's the problem. And, and of course, everyone listening, you know, you know, you know, you know. And this is almost like preaching to the choir, but this gives you an idea of the mental attitude. He said that since he doesn't have anything to hide, he never feels worried when he passes through one. Well, of course not. Of course not. But see, just because you don't have anything to hide that does not or should not give you license uh i mean hey you go ahead put me under surveillance i don't have anything to hide go ahead and look into my computer i don't have anything to hide mm. oh my goodness i don't care if i had nothing to hide it, don't even look at my computer let alone look what's inside of it well, well uh, t- Get Tanya. A warrant Tanya Fulmore from Watertown agreed. She says our road checkpoints are necessary to keep our border secure. Are you kidding me? <laughs> wait, wait. Um, they are necessary to keep our border secure. Right. We're uh, endangering the security of our border because the uh, illegal immigrants have been coming in and out. Yeah, there's cartel and drug violence, but uh, they're being you know, ushered in, welcomed in, handed driver's license when they get here. Right. Uh, food stamp uh, cards, uh, cell phones. So that's uh, a, a straw man argument because apparently immigration isn't illegal anymore. No, uh, no, no. So is it the drugs? I mean, that that makes sense, but <laughs> not in the U.S.-Canada border, really. And if it, they do that, that should be done with the customs at the border. Well, uh, yes. And, and I mean, you can have surveillance. You know, you can... People think that when you have a show of force or a show of authority, it means more than. Uh, and I know Alex Jones. You know, we, we know Alex Jones covers this a lot and talks about this a lot. We, we, we understand that. And, and we, we, and folks, you'll see the videos of people going through checkpoints. And 
Um, here's what I'd say about that. Okay, if uh, and I've seen some pretty rough videos out there. Okay, it's my belief that if you go, if you are stopped at a checkpoint within the United States, you, I, I would really highly recommend you number one be respectful, but knowledgeable of your rights. You can, I mean, respectful, don't be a jerk. Of course. Yeah. Okay. But being a jerk is considered not a, a cooperating. At the same no, no, no. Well, what I'm talking about, you can just yeah. say politely, politely. Uh, officer, uh, you have no legal authority to do this. I'm not answering any of your questions. Don't touch my stuff unless you have a warrant to buy. Right. It, it, don't be vulgar. Don't be, uh, you know, be very assertive, but but don't be a jerk about it. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, I know you've seen videos out there that people make these videos and, and they, um, they make them... Uh, for the um, uh, benefit of people that understand how to assert their rights, but 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 they they they, they, they make them for, for in some cases they make them for the uh, uh, what would you call it the shock the, value the shock value thank you thank how far you. can That's, I push it yeah let's not do that let's the best stand up for our I rights saw was, uh, can I go very no what was asked can That's I right. go officers you know being sir can am I, go? I being detained yeah. and can I go That's right I mean and, you have uh, like, let's say we're living in a constitutional republic, which we were. Uh, it was at some point, but um, it's so convoluted now. Who knows what is really the law and what's valid? But either way, um, cops still have protocols, procedures, and standards they have to uh, work under, and they can't operate if those if they're uh, circumventing that. Things get thrown out of court. Look at you know Miranda, for instance. Something as simple as being read your rights. Uh, or not being read your rights was uh, given uh, people who had confessed to crimes a, a walk. But but how many? So those, I mean, people will you know the the judges will stick up for. Um, but how many people, people know? When the officers though? don't follow their procedures, but when the people who li are living today understand we live under a constitution, but have no idea what's in the constitution. There you go. They don't even understand. In the I mean what. Well, it doesn't matter. We have nothing to hide. Well, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with having something to hide. It has something, to, everything to do with your right to travel freely, uh, unmolested, unless there is probable cause to stop you. Now, uh, when you're stopped, you're actually arrested. Well, let me let me ask this question. Then these are this question is for people in, in chat. And if you're listening to this by archive. Feel free to fill out the uh, contact us form at Hagman and Hagman dot com, and, and I'd welcome your your suggestions. We of course have logos for, for our, our you know Watchman Unleashed for our radio show and bumper stickers that we freely give out. Um, we we are in the process of getting more now, and uh, but let me ask this question: Would it be beneficial, do you think, to the listeners, if we had printed up? Uh, the citizens' handbooks. Uh, I know Alex Jones had done this, and, uh, but freely give them out to our listeners who, who would want them. Or, uh, I, I mean, mean, if people ask beneficial? for them, maybe, but I think our listeners are smart enough to understand, to know where to go to look to see what their well, rights are. But but sometimes for, you could you could hand it to the police officer and say, look, uh, you know, here here's a copy of our rights as as we like as we kindergartners. Been, I think for regular people who who say go along with this, we should have a thing where you pin it on their shirt or put it in their pocket, like the cards, where they can look and see and say, okay, well, I'm being stopped. Did I do, did I break a law? Well, no. No, okay. I, I mean, no, I don't want to make this sound like a... No, I'm being serious, because people don't, I'm not saying treat them like babies, but we have to start at a ground level, because people aren't even operating with the intelligence of what actually the laws and... Um, well, see, I mean, they're making it about what he had to hide. I think it's good right. because it keeps this off the street. They're talking about keeping something off the streets that's not even illegal that our government. I mean, they let the drugs in too, but uh, you know, where have people been on the immigration issue? I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of people coming in, you know, month by month by month, and it's increasing and increasing. You have judges being letting go thousands, you know, weekly here and there because things are overcrowded. Um, People are giving. I mean, there is no such thing as illegal immigration anymore. <laughs> no, so that's there, true. It's a it's a straw man and a moot argument. Yeah, speaking of judges, we're, and we're, here we are in the North Country uh, of New York, Watertown. Uh, I believe that that's where I 
I when you say judges, I, I, I we were in a in a court uh, hearing. I think that's where I threw the TV at, or I shouldn't say at, toward the judge after he. Uh, I mean, it was it was a fit of righteous anger. I, I actually when he threw when he was throwing me out of his courtroom, I threw the TV in his direction. Oh, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah, and he was testifying, and we. <laughs> the whole thing was is we this guy was on workers' compensation. Uh, he also trapped animals, and my dad uh, presented himself as a writer Columnist. for CFP, P, yeah. candidate for your best, which he was. He yeah. said he was doing yeah. a story on on animal trapping, and well, the guy was not smart enough. He he was stupid enough to let us, you know, while being on workers' compensation, to let us videotape and follow him around as he's setting these traps and doing this and that. We go to court, making and, money at it too. The by judge. The way said you're a liar and yeah. he said no i'm not i didn't lie uh yeah. you weren't misrepresenting yourself and um you know you made the point police you know lie in interrogation but that's well, it was further a, than what it's you called did. a pretext right and the guy said i don't care get out of my courtroom yeah the judge and and, and my dad at the time uh we, i don't we, know we, if your back was was worse but i remember i heard a lot back then you took that tv up and hurled it <laughs> and the attorney came out and, and kind of was like, you know, settle down, settle down. <laughs> yeah. This judge was like 180 years old. Um, I thought he was going to jail. Yeah, I, I, I'm just I, sitting in the court astonished. It was like one of the first times I was in, not the first, but one of the first few times I actually was in the court listening to testimony. I, I, I got to say, I'm not quiet, sure. So. I'm not exactly sure why I didn't wasn't arrested, but but we certainly didn't hang out in the county for very long after that. We and that we, was your TV too. Yeah, which yeah. Which had the the actual documentation on the. It was so long ago it was videotape. Okay, so that tells you how long ago it was. And and uh, to finish that story out, um, in New York State, basically, if you're on workers' comp and you get caught defrauding the state, you go to jail. No, I've never seen that. Oh well, no. You seriously, you do. If you can, you can if you can prove. Okay, if they can prove uh, financial benefit. Uh, Deriving financial benefit if you. But isn't the whole point? What I used to think the whole point: if you're caught defrauding, saying you're hurt, and you're not really hurt, financial benefit or otherwise, you're still collecting money from those employers without working. Right. That's fraud in my mind. Of all the times we were in New York, all the people we, people would go to the doctors in wheelchairs, get up when they're gone, done, and go and put on a roof. Never went to jail. Uh, I, I actually, uh, there was one case where I actually saw uh, um, a guy. That we were working uh, in 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 that capacity, or he was a chimney sweep actually, and um, um, yeah, he he actually was taken in handcuffs uh, off the property. But, well, but that probably set a precedent. I never understood it, why the insurance companies would pay the people who are out on work and then pay us on top of it when it didn't matter anyway. Well, it, it was to mitigate their, their their exposure, their losses. But 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 yeah, just getting back to the judge, it was it was interesting because um, uh, you know righteous anger does have a place, and I think I was probably protected by the. Well, in the end of this God. article, federal law enforcement yeah. has a job to do, and sometimes even following procedures. Yep. Sometimes innocent people do get injured. <laughs> well, let me say, tell you something. Those procedures are illegal. Right. Right. This is a commenter, uh, Tim Drew, an Arizona resident. So he went from one southern border checkpoints to northern border checkpoints and says that um, but there are procedures and things of that nature to fix those kinds of things. I mean, it's regrettable, but when you enforce procedures in light of recent security situations, innocent people do sometimes get hurt, and it's unfortunate, but I don't find it to be wrong. So he doesn't find it to be wrong that innocent people get hurt sometimes, because he, in his mind, it's justified by the greater good. Uh, uh, welcome see. to communism, socialism, Nazism. Yeah. yeah. And, and wasn't it uh, uh, the gentleman uh, Michael Mayer from uh, Czech, the Czech Republic who said that their that the freedoms they enjoy there in the Czech Republic? This is the third hour of Steve Coyle and Ross Powell when uh, uh, Michael from Czech, the Czech Republic called in. The freedom there is, is much greater than here in the United States, and, and you can see the, the scale of the pendulum going the other way here in the United States, where we are losing our freedoms, and uh, this is part of it. The attitude is part of it. So, back to my question: How do you change the attitude of of people like? Um, uh, well, let's see. I'm looking at this article here, uh, Tim Drew. 
Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to get the names wrong, but the, the people who think, hey, they're, if I've got nothing to hide, it's okay. Well, you can go stand on the left side. We'll stand on the right side, and uh, we'll see who, who common sense takes them longer in this decaying nation. <laughs> Those would be the first people to walk into the FEMA camps. And, and, and getting back to what you said about the uh, about the Romans thirteen, the Butch Pa article uh, taking the uh, taking the pastor to task over saying, well, you know, you've got to follow the the civil authority based on Romans thirteen. This is what this is all about. I mean, is, take a few steps back, everyone. Take a few steps back and take a look at what's going on, and and compare it to what happened in Germany. And I know some of this sounds like, oh, well, this is the same old stuff, but but you know we have to really pound this home because the closer we get to that very moment when we will be forced to choose, to me, will be that will it's going to depend on the numbers. It's going to depend on the people who will say, no, we're not going to do this. And it's the same way with flying in the TSA. You're not going to touch me. You're not going to nuke me. We have to make the changes. We have to get these everything changed. We have to do this, even if you believe it's a lost cause. Because remember what, uh, uh, well, r- remember what's been said by Pastor David Langford, by uh, Dave Dobbenmeyer, by Greg Jackson. Even if it's a lost cause, you still have to stand in the gap. You have to stand up for what is right. Because what's the alternative? go along to get along and say, okay, well, we're just, I'm just going to do this. No, no, we can't. And if you can't speak for yourself, if you're infirmed or elderly or, or otherwise impaired, then we need, I believe, it's our job to speak for you that, on your behalf, not for you, I mean, on your behalf to help you. That's what I believe. And we're all in this together. We're all in this mess together, this soup of craziness together are we not oh man i'll tell you why we we need to take a break joe we do uh we're up against it here we have to readjust the program clock to get back on uh on time here uh but uh uh yeah uh, folks i i don't know i i i just you know i i just look at this and i know that you know that you feel the same way i feel or at least pretty much you feel like time is short as time is running out time is what what could what good can we possibly do please don't lose that faith don't lose faith in being able to change things because god does work miracles and you know we we can't put god in the box and we certainly can't presuppose god's um actions and one thing i've learned is that a defeatist attitude is definitely not the way to go. That's I used right. to think, you know, well, what's the point? Yeah, I, and I it's mean, easy to think I understood that. the the biblical and prophetic aspect and the work, the Lord's working had to be fulfilled. But as far as this country, this road we're on, in my mind, I know right, I see right where it's going. We know right where it's going. But at the same time, there are as the boats sinking and people are getting in lifeboats. And we'll, that's salvation in Jesus. We have to help them get in. Right so we, we can't, you know, uh, greet them with, glad, glad you're in the boat, you're going to die. No. But you know what I mean, the the attitude that we are helpless, because we're not. We're told to occupy till the Lord returns. We're told to preach his gospel across um, as many people who will listen. And these are the things that we have to do, whether it's sunny or snowing or whether, you know, it's country of unrest or like it is now uh, a country of unrest with laws <laughs> we have a job to do no matter if society's functioning or not right oh and i i know this is kind of going back a little little ways and i know that you mentioned this joe but i would urge people i mean those people who are still not convinced who still think that uh, we're hyping news stories up about the war on cash I know, Joe. You mentioned this. The IRS seized 107,000. Yeah, we talked about this off there. Yeah, 107,000 from a store owner of L- L&B stores. Uh, he owned a couple stores, and he is, a, is in a cash business and making cash deposits. Civil asset forfeiture. The IRS came in, seized his 
$107,000 of the entirety of his bank account. Never charged him with the crime, kept the money. Well, yeah, Lyndon McClellan's a guy. He's been in the business of country stores, the type of stores where, you know, the employees know the customers' names. And um, his parents owned a general store um, in Grill. McClellan began helping out there when he was nine. Then 14 years ago, McClellan decided to try his hand at the family business himself. So he purchased his own store in the heart of the Bible Belt. L and M Convenience Mart, and of course, you know how that is, right? You collect a lot of money at the cash register. No wonder Obama keeps his money under the mattress. <laughs> well, the the bottom line is this: um, he was making cash, or he's making deposits in his bank in cash. Well, um, uh, what? No, nope. <laughs> what? It's illegal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Last July, he received a call from one of his employees saying, hey, you better get over here to your store. He got there, and there were more than a dozen agents that had flooded, federal agents who had flooded into his business. Mind you, over a thousand of these agents never paid, have never paid taxes on their own and are supposed to be fired for that, yet they're still working. Right. Well, here goes the store owner, McClellan. He bounces into the store, and he met two federal agents dressed in suits who said, Hey, I got to talk to you in private. These two agents did. So McCollum led the agents to the stock room, where they asked him, they asked him if he knew of uh, the term structuring. He said, "Huh? What? What structuring? What are you talking about?" Well, the federal agents then showed McCollum paperwork that included deposits to the store account. Uh, the statements showed two deposits made within the twenty-four hour, uh, twenty-four hour period, totaling. Are you ready for this? Eleven thousand four hundred dollars. Now, this is for a, a, a business, a thriving business in North Carolina. So the statements, they said, indicated that his, he had a history of consistent cash deposits of less than $10,000, which is illegal. In other words, if you – let's say, you, you, let's say you, you try to avoid the reporting requirements. You know, you make $9,999 deposits thinking you're, you're way cool, right? Well, anyway, bottom line is they seized – they took all of the money in his bank account, which is $107,702.66. And he said, are you telling me you took my money? He didn't understand what was going on. Imagine that. Imagine that. He was like, he was gobstruck for 10 minutes, man. He was saying, what are you guys doing? They took all of his money out of the bank. And law enforcement, um, or after the uh, agents left the store, he drove to the bank. The agents had been there hours earlier. They emptied his bank account. They walked out of the bank with a cashier's check. And uh, but, <laughs> yeah, the bank had, had his money to give away. He, though he know, didn't know it at the time, McClellan was uh, committed structuring violations when making cash deposits of less than $10,000. I mean, you, if folks, were, you, you we're screwed, basically. Well, what about the government? Okay. I mean, the government receives, the IRS, for example, tax time, how much money did they receive in individual payments from people? But, but you know, I, I had a kind of a, a, a curt email to me when we were talking about the uh, uh, studio, and the run-up to getting the studio, and I was saying that, you know, it – you have when you apply for a commercial mortgage, and I feel sorry for the people who are applying for home loans. Um, when you apply for a mortgage, for example, they they you take your bank account statements in, and all of a sudden you just, they start asking you questions. Well, what is this eight hundred and ninety-two dollar deposit for? Excuse me. Yeah, back in January twenty fourteen. You deposited eight hundred and ninety two dollars into your bank. What was it for? How in the world do I know? I mean it was a deposit it was a, during a normal course of business. but see, this is folks do not underestimate what's going on here, and this is why the cashless aspect is yeah, so important. exactly it's not just that they think there's a danger or think there's something going on. They're creating the problem and then they're implementing steps to to make it worse in order to bring in the solution that will make it all better. Exactly. 
and, and really pretty, how long until somebody's paychecks you know um, well you, you know that that's that's why it's be it began didn't it begin with direct deposits the convenience of direct deposits for your paychecks and the, your your i r s tax refunds it's all not i mean it's being sold to you as a matter of convenience, but in the end it's a matter of control. And uh, it allows the government to, under, to to know where the money came from. So you're, and, and during the course of of us, you know, uh, being able to acquire this the studio, I had uh, really had some cross words with the with the uh, mortgage lender, saying, you know, uh, w- well, I answered one question. Uh, you know, where did this money come from? I said that was from our meth proceeds, the proceeds from our meth lab. You should have said proceeds from selling weapons to ISIS. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting they didn't take that too kindly to that answer, but you just get so frustrated, and, and it's enough to really, you know, make you want to just kick the wall, you know, and uh, I think I might have a few times. I'd say just getting, of you getting kicked out of the banks is showing a lot of restraint, <laughs> more than I would. Yeah, well, folks, we're up against it. Uh, here we did. Uh, we we already passed the top of the hour, but uh, we're gonna be right back. You can weigh in. Why don't you weigh in, ladies and gentlemen? Tell us what you think. What's on your mind this this fabulous Friday? We're sitting around the kitchen table tonight, or it seems that way, doesn't it? Or around the uh, dining room table, whatever you want to call it. But we're just having a casual conversation Taking about current events. Step back and, and yeah, just kind of yeah. But 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 you know. Let's take this opportunity in this relative quiet, and, and let's let's get prepared for what's coming. You, you know our partners, our partners, and what we do here in the radio, American Survival Wholesale. You know it's a veteran-owned, Christian-owned company. You know that you need to be prepared. Don't fall victim to the mentality out there, the toxic mentality that God will provide. But you don't have to lift a finger, okay? Yeah, just because you're preparing doesn't mean it's for you either. That's right. You know, I would much rather have it and not need it than not need it, or than not have it and need need it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for billing me out on that. But American Survival Wholesale, we've done a lot of research with companies, and and any sponsor, any partner that we have. Anything that appears on our website, let me explain that we do a lot of research because we do not want to associate ourselves with people or with product that um, products that are, that are not up to standard. And American. I have a story to tell. Go ahead. Um, I had a, a gardener slash landscaper at my house uh, yesterday, and we were talking, and I was showing where I'm planning on building the, the garden um, at my new place, and I have a, a thing of the uh, non-GMO heirloom seeds for forty nine ninety or forty nine dollars on American Survival Wholesale, two hundred dollar value. Um, and I was talking with the guy, and sh- I opened the package of seeds, and they're all individually packaged with and labeled inside. And the guy was astounded, and he asked, "You know, how much you get this for?" And he, he was, he said, "This is a uh, amazing." Uh, he doesn't know American Survival Wholesale. Not, I mean, doesn't know, didn't even come up what we do and why right. I had it but um he just wanted to know how where I got these from these seeds from um and when I told him the price and everything he was he was shocked well and it comes in a small small box i mean seeds are not that big obviously but um it, but very nicely packed and very nicely labeled but these non GMO hybrid seeds, these non GMO seeds, uh, folks, uh, what? How, how? At least one acre, 30 one acre. different varieties. Yeah. Yep. Um, just fant- I mean, everything you need, you know, tomatoes, uh, fruits, they have watermelons, they have uh, the tomatoes, they have cantaloupe, they have um, all kinds of stuff, you know, all and many different varieties of each one also. That's right. I think there was like four different varieties of tomatoes. Five different varieties of lettuce. Um, they have kale. They have all. I mean, just everything. It's all encompassing garden. Yeah. And, and you know what? If the billionaire globalist elite are are putting aside seeds, then I think it's a good idea. Um, not because they're doing it, but uh, you know, it it 
in the Food Safety Modernization Act. They outlawed yes. the uh, trade, sale of, cert- of people, certain people from uh, trading and buying and, and transferring seeds. Exactly. And we we need to see you know we need to prepare for what's coming and and we need to to not just prepare for what's coming but uh, stay ahead of the this legislation the things that will affect the way we do business the way we do commerce and, and I think that that uh, American Survival Wholesale has done their homework I know they have and I know they're staying a step ahead of. Of everyone else, and how how soon before we can't get non-GMO seeds? I, I mean, think about that. And, and folks, please um, think about not just yourselves, but your family, your friends, your neighbors, because when crises, plural, hit, it's going to affect everyone. And if you can help another person by having that extra pack that extra can of food, whatever it might be. You can use it for barter. But expect rough times. I don't know if it's going to be next month, next year, five years. It's coming. The shelf life of the seeds and the foods will far outlive um, your... 25-year shelf life. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and you know what? Look, since we're talking about this, we can forego the intro. Folks, you know you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. It's Friday. It's the 15th day of May 2015. Um, the preparation is, par- is really an important part of it. Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com and uh, stock up on what you can. Do so now while it's relatively quiet because we do... Um, we this is we're back into the show now. Uh, we for we, we we just discarded the opening uh, uh, opening bumper and we're back into the show. I would just want to share something. I think it's important. We got a call, Joe. You got this phone call today. The thing I did not tell you today, this morning, um, I received some information. Well, I'll just flat out tell you from my niece in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, here's the situation. My wife's niece, actually, to be accurate. You got the card right Okay, here. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my story, and then you tell your bit of informa- my information. Oh, this your is, information. okay, separate. Okay. This is separate, but this, I was waiting for a second confirmation on this. Ladies and gentlemen, please pay attention to what we're about to tell you, because this information has not gone out over the year. And this is... Um been obviously now confirmed so and the people that i've heard it from i have no doubt in my mind okay um, this is nothing but 100 percent truth all right it's it's concerning right my uh my wife's niece works at a trauma center in cleveland now that's as far as i'm going to say okay when i say trauma center er type situation she, when when my wife told me this, I had I called this morning. I called my my niece who was, she she was off today, and I said I need I need some information. I need to talk to you. And she thought she thought my my wife had something happened to my wife because I never call her, never call her, and it was so out of the ordinary. I said I want to ask you a couple of questions. She answered the questions, but here's the gist of the message. Please pay attention to this. In the city of Cleveland, there are certain, I know of one, that's where she works at, trauma centers that are being designated to accept mass casualty patients this summer. Now, hear me again. I can confirm this. Nothing has, nothing is in writing which bothers me because I asked for something in writing. Is there a written directive, either internally or by the federal government? And she said no. Now, she is pretty high up, um, assistant to the director of the trauma unit. Um, so she no, she would have access to this. But, but here's her story. And then I'm going to turn it to you, Joe, with the story you got earlier in the week. In the city of Cleveland, Ohio, um, 
a federal agent, a single federal East agent. Of Cleveland. Okay, yours is uh, I'm, I'm, okay. Okay, mine's in the city uh, of Cleveland. A single federal agent had come, uh, went to the um, administrator, or actually to the hospital administrator, and then the head of the trauma unit with the hospital administrator, and said, "What we want you to do." is make sure that you're well equipped for mass casualty accepting mass ca- patients numerous mass casualty patients uh, of trauma mass trauma patients in other words gunshot wounds stab wounds uh, blunt force trauma as early as july 1st be prepared we'll make sure you have all the supplies you will be the designated or one of the exact words, one of the designated health centers, trauma centers. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your hospital, your your health, your ER, if you will, will be designated as the trauma center for a mass casualty event, one of other one of several. So check your supplies. Make sure you you can treat a number of patients concurrently and make sure you've got enough supplies. And your deadline is July 1st, 2015. Okay, that's my story. And that that and and I have this is the first time I've said that publicly and I intend to, to do a report on this using this information and Joe go ahead with your information. Yeah, I received a, a call from a, a a friend and and a listener who uh used to live in Cleveland and they still um know people there and one of the uh local religious leaders has a family member in, in a hospital east of Cleveland. And he called the other day just to just to explain this to me that the federal government came into the hospital and told them, uh, similar to what you just stated, that they need to start training now to handle mass trauma and casualties due to riots, uncontrollable riots, um, from beginning early to midsummer, from the hundreds to the thousands. And this place is um, a hop, skip, and a jump from Cleveland. Okay. And uh, for them to come in, it was not local, state, uh, authorities that there was a, a federal authorities and there was not specific uh, they were not specific on who the federal authorities were what division or branch they came from but <coughs> very similar uh echoing the very similar statements but by the way uh the official that came came under the umbrella of the department of homeland security dhs and uh there's a person in chat saying that the feds have been doing this uh, going around and, and to the hospitals and uh Almost like it's a procedure, from what if I'm reading this correctly. But um, well, a new procedure. To us. Well, yeah. When you have a date certain or a date, they say, look, we want to have we 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 make sure your supplies are uh, and your staffing is capable of handling a mass casualty of event as of July 1st. Then you take it a step further. They have a location. They have a time. Well, what's going to happen? Why do you think there's going to be unrest? Unless it's going to be so widespread, they're just going everywhere. Um, but for two reports to come in the same week, and, and, and well, and either they're my, just my wait, question. making their way to our the, this area, or they are doing it for a reason. No, no, this my contact has worked at this location for twelve years. Not once in twelve years has this happened. So, uh, well, we're fourteen years off from nine eleven, right? Um, so you would think that, and and again, my question to this source was, is this, you know, has this happened before? No. Is, do you, did you feel this is normal? Like a, uh, we just want to make sure in the event something happens. No, this had the feeling of, okay, so we are expecting something. So make sure you're ready. Now, um, you can't, I, I mean, this is a source within a hospital, 
being visited by the Department of Homeland Security outside of Cle- or in Cleveland. Yours is outside of Cleveland. Um, very specific information, quality control check, or just making sure that you know if something happens. No, no, it, it had a different feel, flavor, and uh, uh, texture to it. This was a to her. This was something that was notable enough to let us know because she knows, of course, what we do. And she felt very unnerved by this. Now, your source, and I thought of that right away, Joe. Um, Man, there's something not right here, obviously. Boy, that's a brilliant statement, right? Um, But I do believe that they are, they, the government, is expecting or even planning for something to take place. What could it be? Well, let's look at the information. July 1st in my case, years midsummer, right? Not so early specific. Early to midsummer. Early to midsummer. Okay, July 1st would be early to mid. Mm-hmm. So it, the information seems consistent. Trauma, mass trauma, mass casualty event. When I, mine was pretty specific in terms of, you know, uh, well, it could be it could be anything from bricks falling on people to uh, gunshot wounds to whatever tra- whatever trauma would be. Now, we're not talking biological. We're not talking. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying trauma cases. What would bring that about? Rioting. Well, what would bring rioting about? Now, this is speculation. You know, anything, right? I mean, uh, a monetary collapse, you've got... Cleveland is, is getting so terrible yeah. as a city. It's like the, the new Wild West. It's like New New York City or New Orleans, you know, and they were the murder capitals of the, the country. Right. Cleveland, is crime rate has been skyrocketing well, in the last few years. But, so, but, but the, we, we, that would be a number of things. It could be a, a, a power outage that lasts a couple of weeks or longer. It could be usually the, the, the power outages just have uh, the result of more childbirths. Nine I mean, months later. I will say this: that I know that there was a uh, unarmed uh, young African American who was killed by police there not too long ago, and I don't know if that trial is still ongoing or what's the the status of that. But um, we didn't see any any um, craziness when that happened, uh, which speaks to Cleveland and, and how they handle <laughs> yeah. things. Uh, but how many times can that happen before it does cry? I mean, people do see it as, you know, this is enough. Well, what would make, uh, I, I guess my concern is what would make, what would cause a federal agency to send? So, because they know that people will talk. They know that people will say, uh, oh, and there, the other issue to this, and I should point this out, nothing was allowed to be put in writing. And, and that was odd. Okay, when I say nothing was allowed to be put in writing, um, think of it this way. We don't want you to we don't want you to uh, to issue any directives. We want you to be ready. And it was a verbal message conveyed in person, not by fax, not by email. So that, to me, the method of, 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 of conveyance speaks to some level of, uh, well, it being on the, on, on the QT anyway. Now, I, I understand the, the hey maybe we don't want to uh, make it a self fulfilling prophecy maybe we don't want it to get out on the alternative media like it's getting out now or at least they've got some level of plausible denial about it which would make us look you know like numbskulls okay we don't know but it certainly was unusual and is unusual. Look, is this is this you know what is this? I don't know, but you everyone listening deserves to know. And I'm wondering if if it's happening in the Middle Atlantic area, meaning Cleveland, Ohio, and and points around there, is it happening elsewhere? And if you have any information 
the listener, if you're in the healthcare industry and you've got similar information, we would appreciate it. We'd be so appreciative if you would let us know through our contact us form, and we will assemble, uh, 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 compile a report, and issue a, a statement or issue an investigative report noting the locations and, and the gist of the information. Because we look, we're we need to get as our hands on the DOJ uh, employee manifest and where they go ahead of time and start setting up because we know they're already in these towns, but when the, this stuff happens, yeah. it's been proven in St. Louis and in um, Ferguson that, that the people who are the ones that are creating and starting the violence have actually been off-duty police officers, um, instigators, who agitators who come in from other uh, areas of town just to do this. Kind of like a, what was that job, the union buster? Yeah. Uh, only it's a, a, probably a higher paying, more risky job. But, I mean, you can go on YouTube and see protests from other countries when people start to get violent. I, I know one in specific, specifically, I think it was in Greece, um, you had these people throwing Molotov cocktails trying to turn cars over, and the, the crowd caught on to the fact they were all wearing the same pants and boots. And uh, when they got caught, they tried to jump behind the police lines, and it turned out they were police officers. The, the, the template appears to be the same. And if you look at... Uh, you know, one one thing that always amazed me is how how quickly can you have professional signs made up for protesters from the moment of the event to the spontaneous <laughs> the spontaneity of the protest, and all of a sudden they're walking carrying these professionally made signs. Okay. That should tell you something, and, and you're right, Joe, about the the, the attire, the, the similar attire of people, uh, the protesters, and their methods of operation. So what we have, we believe, is a network of professional agitators, and, and that's probably being nice, that are operational throughout the United States that are either on the payroll of or working on behalf of rogue government agencies, including but not limited to the Department of Justice. The whole, the, it, now, when I say the Department of Justice, I'm talking about the rogue element there because undoubtedly there are people there who are clueless, they're doing their job, they're you know working, but you've got that, it would be like the CIA, you know, the shadow government, if you will. That's actually running things. So, please, folks, be aware of this. We don't know what's going to happen. The the our July first date, maybe that's an arbitrary date. I don't know. We don't know. We're just passing this information along for what it's worth, for any value it may hold to you. But please, we ask that if you have information personally, we'd like to know, and we will keep your name out of it. Um, just you know the location, and pretty much the uh, gist of, of the information. So we can warn others because, like I said, um, hey, we've got family in Cleveland. We're concerned. We have family elsewhere, like you. I mean, each and every one of you we consider family. We'd like to, we'd like to be able to serve as a clarion call for, for something. And, and but let's do it smart. Let's do it intelligently. Let's do it so we can see danger and get ourselves out of harm's way, or at least prepare for it. And if you're alone or infirmed, and these, you know, it, it concerns me the most the, the people that have no one. Man, you know, if you've got a family and friends, a structure of support. Consider yourself the luckiest people in the world. I mean, you know, and, and but if you're alone, hurting, uh, you know, look at us as being part of your family. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but we want to, you've got a special place in our heart. And, 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 you know, we'd move mountains to make sure that you're okay. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Because I, I I would look at it like a daughter or a sister having a daughter or sister living in like big old bad L.A. or something. You know, you, you your heart's out there and you want to make sure that she's okay. 
And uh, if you know trouble is coming, you want to be able to warn these people, and you want to make sure they're okay, and we want to help. So this is why we're giving this information. I hope that I hope that helps. And it's not meant to frighten anyone. It's meant and it's meant to alert people out there. And I'll be talking to Steve Quayle about this as well. So um, because I, I really think um, this does fit with some of the information Steve's been getting in other parts of the country. But if, if you have any information, please go to Hagman and Hagman.com, click on the contact us form, send it to us. If we don't respond back to you, that doesn't mean we haven't read it. We haven't, uh, you know, done the uh, compiling of, of the information. All that means is we're busy behind the scenes getting the information to where it needs to be. And, um, that's, that's the big thing. So it, this summer, you know, who knows, but expect at some point, the uh, the ATMs to be turned off, the cash to be limited, the uh, gas prices where it's available to go up, and and they, these these things are coming to this country. But we can't stop, regardless of what's looming. We can't stop fighting for what's here and now. Like Coach Dave Dobmeyer. Um, we have to fight for justice. We have to fight for justice for the sake of justice. Who will stand for justice? For justice' sake. We must. Each one of us must. That's that's my view. I mean, I don't know how you folks feel about it, but we must stand in the gap. We must play our position. The position that we were called to play. Whatever it might be for for you, and please know that everyone's position is going to be different based on personal circumstances. We're not given the same set of instructions. And again, Coach Dave uh, passed information along to us that um, I just want to mention this is uh, people in the chat room are talking about Mr. Ken Hove and his trial has been delayed. So uh, before you head down, anybody who planned on heading down to, to Florida for that, um, take a step back and, and check the information again because uh, the prosecution filed for some kind of continuance and apparently received it, so the trial's not going to be uh, starting when thought. So, You know, about Ken, Ken Hoven, my view is the same with Irwin Schiff. Uh, Irwin Schiff basically received a life sentence regarding taxation from a court who the judge said the Constitution has no place in my courtroom. Since when? Kent Hoven, basically the same thing. Uh, this is unconstitutional. Yeah, and, and that's we terrible. Need, you, you know what? We but, need the people. We need to be there. We need to stand up and say, this is wrong. And, and you're exactly right. At the same time, to look at the positive in the situation, the Lord does have us all where he has us for reasons we, and I've learned this the hard way, for reasons we can't even begin to comprehend at this moment. Not that that justifies what, what's happening to him, but... Correct, and, and, and let's make that an clear. Example to it, others, it could be something that's going on with him. I mean, who knows? Yeah, and, and there was... Uh, um, we we could tell we could tell you different stories about uh, people who were you know, there was a well there was a a, a uh, priest or a minister in Poland who was forced underground actually into the sewers the su or not the sewers but the subways um, once preaching to uh, to congregations above ground. When I say above ground, I'm actually physically above ground and overtly preaching. And during the um, the communist takeover, was forced underground. And the communists thought, okay, well, we're going to put this very effective preacher, this very effective minister, into the worst job to make sure, to, to neuter his ability to get to the people. And he was placed as a janitor in the subway system in Poland, but what he did was he, by virtue of his position and by all the people that came through, he ministered to more people and as a result was more effective in that position in in, in saving souls than he could have been or was above ground. 
Now imagine that. So sometimes God does work. God does put us where we need to be. But uh, that doesn't make it right, of course, the, you know, the, the pushing it pushing them underground. So while we can, we still have to fight. We have to make our presence known. And if that gives us a day or two or a hundred days of normalcy for our children, then praise God. You know, we need to we need to do that. You know, I was just thinking as I was talking, um ten years ago I wouldn't be talking like this. <laughs> I was telling Steve the other day, what am I doing? I mean, I'm, you know, and he said that God has, has put us in certain positions, and he's ready. And as he's moving us around, and, and maybe some of you have been moved around recently. Maybe maybe you've moved physically, but don't know why, or, you know, out of the blue, suddenly, bang. It seemed like everybody we talked to there for a few months was moving. Yeah. It's very strange. I I, I believe, and, and after talking with Pastor David Langford, I believe that God is actually putting his people, people like you and like us, in positions where he needs us to be. And we just have to be obedient. Sometimes it doesn't seem to make any sense. But we need to do it. And um, while we still can, while we have the opportunity, we need to fight for the people who can't, who don't have a voice, the Kenthovens of the world, the Irwin Schiffs of the world, the people incarcerated. We need to, we need to fight. And the other thing I want to mention this because this has been on my heart too. You know, there's talk about um, ISIS being here in this country. I have no doubt in my mind that ISIS is here. But it's it's not necessarily just ISIS. It is the Islamic. Um, it's it's the combination yeah. of Islamic terrorists. Yeah. Let me country. jump in here with a headline. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that I found that was very interesting about ISIS. ISIS leader. And let me make sure. I don't know if this is the one where I need my my spelling name here. No. Okay. ISIS leader declares Islam was never a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of fighting. He calls on Muslims to fight for the caliphate in a new audio message. Wow, that's a true statement. I mean, imagine that. Yeah. The the leader of the Islamic State has declared Islam is a religion of fighting in a rare audio message with called on, which called on Muslims to fight for the caliphate. Islamic State released a message yesterday claiming it was from its leader Abu Bara. Uh, Bakar al-Baghdadi al is the extremist group yeah. executed 26 civilians before reaching the gates of the ancient Syrian city amid fears they could destroy it. The audio message posted on militant websites features a voice that sounds like al-Baghdadi's exhorting all Muslims to take up arms and fight on behalf of the group self-styled caliphate. In the leader who had not been seen or heard from in months, said Islam was never a religion of peace. Islam is the religion of fight. No one should believe that the war that we are waging is the war of the Islamic State. So and it goes on anyone who, to, to the, the people from the Council, right. So the people from the Council on American Islamic Relations, although we, we are not uh, the Pam Geller and Robert Spencer's, uh, you know, hosting free speech and Muhammad drawing events. So we still, uh, I mean, look, we don't have to be. We just have to tell the truth. The truth is Islam is not a religion of peace. Oh, wait a second. You're going to shut us down or try to shut us down because we're being intolerant and we're actually, this is hate speech? No. We're just simply repeating al-Baghdadi's message about Islam. But folks, understand this. In St. Louis, right now, there are sleeper cells getting ready to fight that have amassed weapons, and I mean a lot of weapons. Why St. Louis? Why did I mention that? Because we have information. The West. Well, we've got information about uh, coming to us through reputable sources. You know, one of these days you should share some of that information. Well, it's right here on my desk. No, I'm... Now, uh, there's St. Louis and, and Chicago and a couple of other cities who um, there are, are people who are Muslims who are gathering, waiting the word to go out and to paralyze their areas. Let me uh, play the beginning of this audio because I think uh, ISIS captured... Uh
All right. Interesting. If Still you, slowing down the internet. But yeah, if you heard how they attacked, yeah. they said I think thirteen uh, suicide bombs, probably coming in succession of one another, then having certain people, you know, go into these areas to set up shop. Other people pulling bulldozers in, creating this shock and awe type situation. And uh, sorry, tomorrow we'll work on our, our, our uh, alphabet. No, my brain's for bad. You know when you get so tired you can't sleep? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had one of those nights last night. And uh, But, yeah, they are, uh, I don't know, maybe becoming more coordinated um, at a primitive level. I, I don't yeah. know. The, you, you're, you're correct when you say that. The coordination is, and, you know, that's why, folks, ben, you go, gotta go back to Benghazi. You have to go back to the Arab Spring. You have to go back to Obama. I mean, I, look, I understand Bush. Folks, you know, Obama was never vetted. We don't know who that guy is. And, you know, the very people who mocked us, who who, who said that we were crazy, that it was his bona fides that were a distraction. This, it makes me ill to think that we... It, this could perhaps have been prevented. I disagree with. That. I know you do. I, I mean, I understand the word afterwards because whoever would have been in his place, the agenda would still it, went right. But at least, uh, I mean, with you look at Mitt Romney, uh, I know, he was the I first know. to do the health care in the state, the first to do the gay marriage in the state. At least the domestic things we're seeing, he was in line with and agreed with with what was implemented. No, I, I get where you, I agree with that. I do. It, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference. However, but perhaps the, 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 the rapidity or the rapid nature of the acceleration. You know, you question his birth certificate. You're marginalized, called a racist, a hateful bigot for having legitimate questions that are still unanswered. But, you know, um, like I said, these people at, at this level, um, it doesn't matter. It's the agenda that matters. And ISIS was here before Obama was ever a candidate. It was, you know, set up back in the Bush days, back before that, the Mujahideen with That's Al-Qaeda. Right. It's the same CIA office, the same groups of people. That, you know, that's how they move from country to country. Yep. Um, they always have seem to have capabilities far beyond what any... Uh, I mean, go out and try to do this with a group of your friends. And, and, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Are you going to be able to take over media complexes and, you know, get anti-tank weapons? And It's just crazy. Uh, it's the boogeyman, but the boogeyman actually has a deranged purpose. It will well, convince the, right, you know, right. these people that they, they are, uh, you know, who knows what they've told them to, to make them, you know, you say there's no moderate Muslims, or there's no. I don't. I, well, I don't believe one, that one, there, one there of two. There's peaceful, Muslims. or they're they're extreme. They're they're non. They're they're not acting on their beliefs, or they are they acting don't. on their beliefs. Okay, I mean that, that that's the. If you're a Muslim, you're you're either acting I mean, on your beliefs or you're not. You see a lot of people convert to to uh, become with the Islam nation in prison and. Yes. Uh, People who are born here, born into Islam as a religion, they usually, for the most part, never do anything, you know, violent. But you do have those who who do, and then they use yeah. the religion to hide behind it. But, in one of these boxes, I, I showed about a year and a half ago. I, I mapped out the uh, uh, network of uh, uh, of the New York City prison system, where where there the actual. Uh, People that are uh, administering or administration uh, administrators of the New York City prison system uh, are involved in the recruitment of, of yeah. People. Try to get a Christian group, a legislative push group together, and do put it on social media and see how far that gets you. Right. But these people are able to operate on Twitter and Facebook. But you know, heaven forbid, you post a Bible verse on Facebook and you know you're banned for life. Or it's just insane. Uh, who was the? There was somebody recently. Um, who was deleted from Facebook for something um, something ridiculous? 
I, I forget what it was a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. It, it was it was Christian oriented. I mean, it was yeah. because of the Christian faith. And it was a position they took against homosexual marriage or something. And oh yeah, they deleted the Facebook deleted their account. But you know, get a, a sword and a bandana and say you're part of a caliphate and you want to kill people. Well, you know, here here's a computer to get to it. I mean, see, it's crazy. This is com- and this is coming. With the uh, privatization, if you will, or the um, which we we start at least with good intentions, we're going to talk about the internet changes. You see, by by, by ceding control um, uh, of the portions of the internet, and that involves ICANN and, and folks. You, you can research this yourself, but but the objective here is to centralize and to control the content of the internet it's it's really a censorship move and people will say well that's not what it says that's not what this move is all about but what it, it that that's exactly what it is it's just not uh written in crayon for people like John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and and uh the other yucks okay a late night uh, uh pseudo talk show uh, uh host can uh can under can understand or or this is coming to this country, to America, or every place in the West. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, we, you know, I, I can't believe I'm looking here at the program clock, and uh, I see that we're down to the last uh, eight minutes, eight and a half minutes. And uh, uh, you know, folks, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't take any calls. Uh, I really am, and I apologize to you. But I, I, there's a lot of heavy stuff we. I, I, I don't know if you've gotten much out of tonight, but if you if you've got nothing more out of tonight than our than our resolve to double down and to take the fight to the streets, if you will, our resolve now to um, to, to fight on your behalf, to fight on. Um, to fight for righteousness, then we've done our job tonight. Maybe we were a little light on the news. Maybe we were a little light in things that you, you think might have been important. But if if we came across as being sincere in our intent to tell you that the gloves are coming off, that we're taking the gloves off right now, the gloves. Are, well, we've taken the gloves off. Now we're going to be pushing, and, and now we are, are going to take it to the streets. You're going to see our resolve strengthen and tighten, and uh, our alignment with uh, uh, Coach Dave Dobmeyer and, and his initiatives, and Greg Jackson, and uh, the information, getting the information out there necessary information and to protect you who can't protect yourselves because of whatever your situation station in life might be to help you as well to be to be with you as well we're all in this muck and mire together and you know as long as we stay together and and bring others into the fold we can as a remnant prevail. We will prevail because we're already fighting from a position of victory, but we can we can be more effective as a remnant by being on the same page, I believe. And if nothing else, if you got nothing else out of tonight's program, don't underestimate our our resolve now and our uh ratcheting up the fight, our our input in, uh, in our our fight because we are now taking fully taking the gloves off we now have to make a stand we now have to fight against the evil that confronts us and and I'm speaking from the heart maybe I'm not the most well not maybe I know I'm not the most articulate guy in the world but I hope I can make and that makes make, me borderline <laughs> no it doesn't no, but but you know what I, I hope I can make up for that by my resolve and um, you know we, we have to stick together we have to fight together and we have to go after the evil that we see out there 
and, and, and maybe we can only change one small thing. But by changing that one small thing, perhaps, just perhaps, the ripple effect, the consequences from, from that one thing we can change or the one thing we do change. Maybe that will touch the lives of hundreds, tens of hundreds, thousands. Who knows how many? But let's do it for the sake of the for for righteousness, for the sake of just and justice. Because that's what we're instructed to do. And I think that was clear yesterday with, with Coach Dave and Coach Greg, and I think it was clear with Steve Quayle, and uh, I think I think it's been clear, and I think it's a, it's a common common theme. And, and you know, it's it's our responsibility if if we're shut off tomorrow to make sure that we're not shut off completely, and, and that's that's where we're at right now, and I, and, I, and I believe strongly. I, I strongly believe that uh, Rick Wiles said this real quick. He, he said uh, he was in prayer and he, and he asked, uh, you know, God, when when can I stop warning people? And he said uh, the answer was when when the cities were laid to to, to waste. And, and that's the way I feel too. I, you know, when do we stop? We st- we only stop when we don't have any breath left to sustain us. That's when we'll stop. It, it, we're not stopping, in other words. And we're doubling down, and we're tripling down if that's possible. We put it. We're putting everything into this now, everything we got, and stuff we don't get, we don't have. But we're we're bringing the fight. Metaphorically speaking, we took neighbor stuff. To know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but 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 you know, that's what it's all about, and and it's about uh, it's about saving others and about protecting others and about spreading the word, because um, you know this life that we live is is to me is is very short. Yeah, very temporary. And I'll tell you something: as you get older, you realize how short it is. Wow. But uh, you know, nobody's yeah. guaranteed it tomorrow. That's right. And uh, on top of that, we have calamities and, and prophetic uh, pro- scriptures that are yet to be fulfilled, and they're not easy on the mind no, to think not. about, let alone live through. Yeah. So as we, I believe, as we become, you know, more disabled, more chaotic here, it does serve a purpose to build up those who are in Christ and prepare them for the actual worse or, or the parts that are going to be much more horrendous and, and terrifying than the things we think are terrifying and, and bad now. Yeah, exactly. Well, t- t- talk about uh, going from a uh, a well laid out agenda for the program to... Well, see, that's why it was a good show. Kind of... Uh, we needed to get into some of this stuff, and yeah. uh, you know, you want to read the headlines? Just listen to, to the news. They'll yeah, you can. I don't know. Different times each hour, you can catch a few sure. different stories. But we know what's going on. The country is uh, leadership, and each decadent. one of you knows knows what's going on. The majority of the secular world, let alone that the church, the uh, self-proclaimed church world, is um, just as bad as you know as ever more more uh, depraved and and immoral than you know the church self proclaimed christians are more immoral than the a lot of secular people it's all backwards everything's upside down and twisted and that's a, a big red flag um that we need to become more diligent we need to become uh more aware of what the lord wants for us in these days where he wants us to be and what he wants us to do and, and the, the the last thing I'll close out with is this: I am I am not afraid, and and I and I hope none of you are afraid to put your name out there, to put your beliefs out there, to walk proud with your beliefs. You know, I've got uh, I've got a bumper sticker or my logo or our logo on my vehicle, um, and I was thinking, oh boy. Did it, in fact, uh, not only thinking, somebody said that 
that doesn't that make you feel like a target? And I, and I said, you know, you're a target long before any logo is on your vehicle or any, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? So we're not afraid to put our names out there and put our own agenda out there for everyone to see. I mean, that's, to me, that's, and, and I hope you don't feel that way as well. Don't feel like you have to uh, uh, operate in the shadows. You, you you be proud of your beliefs, and uh, together we will prevail. And you're never alone. You're part of our family. And we certainly care about you, and we love every one of you, and we thank God for each and every one of you. Believe me when I tell you that. From your emails to your cards, thank God for you and for your prayers. We thank God for you. Folks, that'll do it for us. Until, if anything does happen of significance over the weekend, we will take you to the airwaves. Otherwise, we'll see you on Monday with Augusto Perez. Joe, great program. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night.